Welcome to HMG Live, a production of HMG Strategy, your global partner helping you to reimagine the business and reinvent the future of work. Home to the HMG Strategy Global Technology Executives Who Matter Awards and also offering the HMG Marketplace, a fast, easy, safe, an efficient way to connect with the right vendors for your technology needs. My own personal experience with connections actually does start with HMG, where I would attend HMG events uh, for the networking opportunities, the opportunity to learn from my peers. It's one of the ways that I became an effective CIO at KLA Tencore. And it was actually at an HMG event in, in 2010 that I got connected to uh, the recruiters at Facebook through a CIO here. Where he These types of events and functions are really important both for uh, you know, people to develop themselves but also for us to just make our profession more effective because we can cross-pollinate ideas and help each other innovate by learning from each other's mistakes and each other's successes. And I think HMG probably does this better than anybody. And now, a warm welcome to today's host, lead principal and CEO of HMG Strategy, Hunter Muller. Hey, good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the 2020 Financial Services CIO Executive Leadership Summit. I'm Hunter Muller, lead principal at HMG Strategy. My team and I are delighted to be here with you today. You know, I'll promise you this, uh, out of the next two or three hours, this will truly be a unique experience. We have uh, an amazing agenda we're going to address really current, really relevant issues around leading, innovating, transforming, disrupting, reimagining, and reinventing the customer experience and new business models and new go-to-market, all together being safe and secure. So uh, buckle up, uh, stay with us throughout the whole summit. At the very end, we'll have the top 2020 tech executives that matter recognition program. Uh, more on that later. So Rubrik's one of our uh, great partners over the years. Rubrik delivers a single pl software platform to manage and protect data in the cloud, at the edge, and on-premises. Enterprise, enterprises choose Rubrik's cloud data management software to simplify backup and recovery, accelerate cloud adoption, and enable automation at scale. As organizations of all sizes adopt cloud-first policies, they rely on Rubrik's Polaris SaaS platform to unify data for security, governance, and compliance. Please. Uh, check out Rubrik, uh, great company. And our other partners include Big ID, Darktrace, Redis Labs, Rimney Street, and Tessian, and Zoom. I see we have a, my good friend Mark Taylor from Sim International is here. Mark, you there? Hey, Hunter, good to see you. How are you this morning? Or Excellent, afternoon. coming in from the great state of Texas. Yeah, we're hanging out here in Austin. Great time of the year to be here. We got a new we got a new resident recently. You may have heard that Elon Musk apparently has moved to my hometown here in Austin. Big news! Congratulations! Yeah, That's yeah. a big find. Lots of good stuff with the local uh, economy here in Texas. So, what's going on with Sim International? Hey, we had a great uh, year, uh, honestly, Hunter. Even with the the uh, the craziness that we've all endured uh, through the COVID crisis, and looking for a great twenty one. And we're next week uh, with you and your team hosting Sim Connect and uh, looking forward to being with you for that. That's going to be a great event and for the entire Sim community and beyond. Great. Looking forward to that very much. And a big shout out to New York Metro Sim. Yeah. Uh, they've, they've been doing a great job there. Yeah. I've got a great uh, core leadership team there and uh, they've built a great community. Hope those that are uh, on the call today will uh, reach out to the local Sim chapter there in New York Metro. A great team of leaders. I think you'll find the community uh, enhancing for you. Excellent. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Hunter. Take care. Great to see you. So help us refine our marketplace. More on that here in a minute. Um, what are your organization's specific technology needs now? If you would simply populate the uh, pop-up uh, quiz, that would be great. And then hit submit. And then you'll have another question around the workplace of the future right behind it um, as well. Uh, appreciate your input, uh, the data. Uh, it will help us reshape, uh, ref refine and reshape the marketplace as well as uh, our agenda as we shape them out for 2021 now. So later in the program, we'll learn more about the, the top technology executives that matter program in 2020 and 2021 and beyond. And we have a little video here we're gonna play. 
Later in today's program, HMG Strategy founder and CEO Hunter Muller will proudly recognize and honor global technology executives who matter. These top-tier CIOs, CISOs, and other technology executives have genuinely distinguished themselves in business transformation, digital disruption, innovation, and talent development through even the most difficult circumstances. These awards are not given lightly. They are earned. Recipients join an elite community of forward-thinking global technology executives in the HMG strategy community. We are delighted to celebrate these exemplary leaders and their teams who have delivered unparalleled value to their organizations, their communities, and our world. Please stay with us for the award ceremony and meet the 2020 global technology executives who matter. Excited if you can stay to the very end of the program and uh, learn more about that. So let's, uh, thanks for zooming in. Let's get the show going. First up, we have Satish Mathu Rishim, Chief Information Data and Digital Officer, Ally Financial. Satish, great to see you. Good to see you, Hunter. How are you? Great. You've had an amazing career, uh, uh, an amazing career ascent. Uh, just a little bit of highlights of your career ascent. Uh, you're obviously here at Ally for how long? And then pre previously, you served where? I started off my career uh, with Singapore Airlines in Singapore. You know, when United Airlines were looking for engineers, nerds, um, they came to Singapore, uh, interviewed and hired me. That's how I moved to, moved to the US. And after having worked for uh, United Airlines for a few years, uh, got the bug to change, moved to American Express, uh, was there for a few years, was lucky enough to lead the digital transformation for American Express globally for about 10 years. Then um, uh, had the opportunity to work for Honeywell Aerospace as their first uh, chief digital officer. A new industry had not been um, uh, you know, disrupted with digitization. Got the opportunity to work there for two to three years. And then this opportunity with Ally came up, which, which I called my role is vertically integrated with data, digital technology, and security. So uh, working for an all digital company was enticing and, and here I am for the last year. So Ally is a digital company in the pandemic. How did you benefit and how did you accelerate? Uh, it's a great question. You know, like I said, Ally was digitally born and digitally raised. So, um, and it was founded with the principle of solving every consumer pain point there is in the banking, banking spectrum. So customer obsession is in our DNA. And COVID situation gave us the platform to showcase that even more. And I'm glad that technology has been central to it in the past, and it's even more central to it right now as Ally is a digital company. You know, our deposit base grew to $120 billion, 45% of those coming from new customers. Our investment, uh, investment business, as, a, as an example, it went up went up to eleven billion dollars, but almost fifty percent or higher customers came from our banking customers. So it shows me just a quick example. It shows that when customers come in, they find multiple products to be uh, to be part of Ally. And the retention rate is greater than ninety six percent. Awesome, great stuff. You know, when you think of technology playing a key role for Ally's employees, customers, and communities through the pan pandemic, um, how would you what would you like to highlight there? Oh, it's a, it's a great question. You know, it, it, three constituents that are so important to us. In, in pandemic, like every other company, we moved our employees to work remotely over a weekend, all 8,500 of them. But what we had to do was give them tools to become productive. So all the way from Zoom, I see Harry joining us, uh, to creating a security gap, uh, uh, doubling and tripling our infrastructure and network. All of that helped employees be productive. From a customer standpoint, you know, going back to your earlier question of Ally being digitally born and intentional about having tech investments, we were able to build a foundation um, and we leveraged that foundation during this time. As an example, we rolled out the, the fastest customer relief package right after the COVID and we had the highest take rates in the industry. You know, whether it was forbearance or deferral of auto loans or home loans, and customers were able to do that digitally. They didn't have to call somebody to get, uh, to get an answer. 
everything was done digitally and the team rolled it out within a few weeks. Um, so that we did for our customers. From a community standpoint, you know, we're very active in Detroit and Charlotte. We have a robust corporate citizens program, but let me, I, I am proud of what the technology organization has done. You know, given the social unrest we, we, we had, given that lower earning employees were struggling more, um, you know, minorities were struggling more during the pandemic, we created a program um, that, that said actions matter. And it was driven to br bring down the digital divide. So what the team did was they took the computers that we usually will shred, they went and degaussed it, cleansed it, and now they're creating a program for underprivileged kids to come and learn over a period of time. And if they successfully graduate, they get to keep the computer for free. And if there is a mutual fit, they'll also get employment with Ally. So a small way in contributing to what is happening across the uh, globe right now. I love it. I love it. It's, uh, what a great story. You know, you started in January of this year. What a, what a year to start a new role. Uh, and you know, what were the key takeaways over the past uh, 12 months? Uh, it's been a terrific year. The culture at Ally, the leadership, um, and, and my own team had made it so easy for me to become part of the family. Um, uh, the, the way I like to operate is always to have a customer first mentality as opposed to a technology first mentality. More than ever, we had to embrace that. And what we did was all of us committed to ourselves that we lead with a business outcome. Understand the business outcome before you bring technology to the table. And that has served as well because what we are seeing is consumer adoption has, is happening at a pace where the, la the last 10 years of adoption we have seen in the last nine months. And then we're also seeing 70% of the consumers that are adapting or coming to digital are going to stay there and do it in the future. Consumers who may have been hesitant to use digital banking tested it out, now they want to stay with it. So that means I have to start with the business outcome and lead with that. The second thing I see is we were able to take a higher execution risk. There is tremendous amount of, I wouldn't say tremendous, there is a little bit of forgiveness with the consumers, with the employees and the leadership given the situation. Everybody is giving each other a little bit of grace that gives us the freedom to experiment. So it also gives us the freedom to take a higher execution risk. So maybe do things in a condensed timeline, maybe do things that we may have not thought of doing it. And, and those are the things that we did, including rolling out a contract rewrite that was 100% digital. Instead of sending documents back and forth, having consumers sign it, doing it digitally was significant achievement for us. And the last thing I would say is, you know, the EQ um, um, became, became, uh, came to the forefront. You know, we might talk, think of it as emotional quotient, but I'm replacing the E with empathy, uh, empowerment, and execution. So how can you take care of your human capital, which is the most treasured asset that you have, and help them deliver for your customers? That was my biggest takeaway. And just, uh, you know, taking care of all of those constituents helped us uh, shine this year. Satish, I love the way you say that. It really does come down to people and the culture that you're able to uh, maintain and grow in this unusual time, right? So other kind of uh, lessons learned or uh, secrets from someone who's been incredibly successful, best practices regarding building uh, a successful culture? Um, you, you know, I, I, the, it, the tone has to be from the top. And I'm so thankful for my, for my CEO, you know, even during my recruitment process, he kept telling me, you know, Ally is a family first culture. Um, you will see that we focus on our, uh, on, our, on our employees. We take care of them like our family so they can take care of our customers. You know, usually, and I, and I admit it, it was words. Um, it felt good to hear that. But after joining it, you, you actually experience it. And, and that, that level of mindset and thinking all the way uh, from all the way up rolls down. And I'll just give you two quick examples. One is when COVID came down, we did a lot for our community. Our CEO rolled out a program which said anybody that is earning $100,000 or less will get $1,200 after tax just to take care of incidental expenses. We accelerated the financial package from 2021 some in, in terms of bonus to 2020. So all of those things in terms of taking care of employees builds a culture of trust 
And then you, you know, your employees will go to whatever extent to take care of your customers. You know, what's next for uh, Ally in terms of your technology focus in 2021? Um, our platform has expanded. I feel like technology has become part of Ally's overall business strategy. Our auto business is booming. Our deposits is thriving. All our adjacent businesses like point of sale lending, mortgage investments are all continuing to grow. There is significant, significant appetite to invest in, in technology. And, and I feel like coming out of COVID, we're going to see a very steep innovation, uh, innovation cycle. We saw that in 2008 when we had the financial crisis, you know, the Ubers of the world, Airbnbs of the world come in. So as a technologist and as a technology organization, we take that responsibility very seriously. And, you know, things, things that might be common, thinking about cloud, AI, all of that is important for us. Products that make sense to consumers, a financial return that makes sense to our shareholders and a culture that will help us execute that and, and using data to make sure that everything that we're doing is right is going to set us, uh, set, us, set us up well for 2021. Exciting times, right? Very exciting. Satish, it sounds like you really hit your stride. You had a great company behind you and it's a perfect fit. What an interesting title you have as well. Uh, I'm so thrilled, excited. We're going to recognize you at the end of the program. Uh, we'll catch you later. Thank you, Hunter. It was a pleasure. Great to see you. Excellent job. Easy to me. Next up, JR Tishore. JR is the CISO of Dark Trace. Hey, JR, always good to see you, my friend. Thanks, Hunter. Great to be here. And we're going to talk about uh, the, the securing the future of work, how cyber AI learns on the job. But a little context about your role uh, and your hit in your career. You uh, you've had some really big uh, CISO jobs in the past. I, I built most of my career at at uh, Micron Technology. Uh, leading U.S. semiconductor and ended up building and running the cybersecurity program there for a number of years. And uh, I got to work on lots of interesting things from insider threat to, to factory industrial control systems to ransomware, uh, lots of great experiences there. And, and it put me in a good position for, for what I do today at Darktrace. I, I obviously work with our internal security program here at Darktrace, but I also spend a lot of time talking with customers about their security strategy, how to think about AI in terms of a cybersecurity program. Uh, and I do a fair amount of coaching mentoring of our own employees here in the US. Awesome stuff. Hey, you know, JR, we learned a lot about disruption and redefining uh, the threat landscape in the past uh, 12 months. Uh, what, how did you help your clients through that disruption and, that, and protecting that new threat landscape, which was so much more uh, evident or su such a larger scale? It's, uh, it's a challenge, and it was a challenge for a lot of CIOs and CISOs. Uh, it's been a very interesting year, and it's been one that a lot of organizations who maybe already had plans around their digital transformation and maybe changing how their IT systems work, they pulled in those plans from 18 months to, to a matter of weeks, and that creates a lot of exciting opportunities to, to rethink how, how IT gets done and to rethink how data moves throughout the organization. It also pulls in a little bit of risk as well. And uh, I really liked Satish's comment about uh, uh, the stakeholders being a little more forgiving during this period. I think, I think that has played out in a number of ways um, in turn with the internal IT department as well. So how, how we think about that then and, and how we partnered was making sure that our platform was also shifting and reflecting that rapid change to, to remote work and, and to a digital transformation and ensuring that we were lockstep with customer needs as they go throughout that journey. So exciting time for us internally and, and from a product development perspective, but also exciting for us to, to be part of our, our customer success story. You know, when you think about it, organizations and security teams all over the world have been reeling from having redefined their whole uh, protective posture uh, in this new extended threat landscape. Any other lessons learned that you've been seeing from your clients? Uh, I, I would say that those that had already been going down a path of, of cloud and mobile and digital transformation fared much better uh, than those that maybe been, have been kicking that can down the road. So I think we've got an opportunity now where everyone is, is some, to some extent forced, but everyone's like leveling up to a consistent uh, uh, approach and consistent patterns with regards to how they use cloud and mobile. So now, now we've got an opportunity to rethink business continuity plans and cyber resilience and IT resilience in this new model. 
and that's one where not every organization has come back around to to, to reviewing that, um, and and that's really probably a lesson that we shouldn't learn twice. You know, Jared, when you think about the hybrid work environment, as people begin to come back to the office, what other kinds of threats or trends are you seeing? Well, I'm not sure everyone's coming back to the office. And when I go out and you know, talk with folks, right, it's it's going to be a complete hybrid and it's going to change and evolve over time. So I think most most IT leaders uh, that I'm working with are are just going to assume remote working model. And sometimes that that laptop or that mobile device is going to be in the office. And that's great. But let's not think about two methods of IT access anymore. Let's see if we can all get to a, a single method. Uh, and that means maybe adopting more BYOD or maybe being more permissive with doing work from home and, and on networks that IT doesn't control. And so from a risk factor, these are, these are the considerations in terms of potentially getting business done on devices that might be hostile or, or certainly are unknown. You know, JR, what's really unique about Dartrace uh, and your AI and uh, your ongoing learning process as you really begin to understand a client's network and uh, risk profile? Dark, Dark Trace was founded on, on, a, on a belief that an organization is going to be better off by understanding internally rather than try to follow every threat and, and every attack externally. And that's a key tenant in the way that, the, that our platform works. We're, we're all about understanding internal data flows, what normal behavior looks like inside that digital boundary. So we're, we're in a much better position to act uh, based, on, based on any anomalous behavior or anything that doesn't appear to be normal. That action is where we're quite differentiated, where we're taking autonomous response in real time based off of AI algorithms that, that we've been building in our labs for a number of years. So this really puts Darktrace in a unique position, not only to understand an organization and continually evolve and continually learn that organization from the inside, but then also in a great position to disrupt the anomalous behavior that, that may occur. You know, a little also about a little bit about uh, Dark Trace's origin uh, being based out of the UK originally. Yeah, really interesting uh, group of folks that came together, uh, a handful of folks out of the AI labs at, at Cambridge University and a handful of folks out of uh, British intelligence. And uh, the intelligence folks knew really what was possible in terms of network intrusion. And they knew that the current landscape of security products weren't necessarily successful in keeping them out of their target environment. So they sat down with the math folks and said, look, how do we rethink detecting ourselves in a network? And the answer from the math folks, of course, is, well, machine learning and, and um, artificial intelligence. And, that was where the, the idea was sparked. Uh, and then over, uh, over the next few years, it's, it's evolved now into an autonomous response capability, a classification and, and investigation capability, and then taking those up into the cloud and working with SaaS and, and endpoints and IoT and bringing all that together into a, a complete picture of the, the company's digital landscape. You, know, you work across industry, you have obviously a footprint, uh, a serious footprint in financial services. Um, anything that you want to touch on in the financial services space, seeing that this is an FS summit? Well, I would say, you know, clearly what we heard from Satish is, is more digital work being done uh, across, across that industry. I don't think Ally is unique in that regard. So, so there's more new things happening, more need for uh, a continual up-to-date and, and learning environment that doesn't require human configuration. Uh, and this is such a big deal when you start thinking about the complexity of some cloud environments. When we look at, at threats, clearly the finance sector is, is concerned about ransomware as are most sectors, right? And, and we've seen that pivot slightly uh, over the, this past year from just an extortion grab or to, to now data being held hostage, or potentially, we've seen this with a, a couple of organizations already, holding the operations hostage and, and keeping a particular service offline through the use of ransomware in order to, to go after that extortion payment. So interesting in developing behaviors from, from the attacker side uh, and new technologies and change on the delivery side makes for a very interesting risk environment. 
any way, any thoughts on how people can learn more about Dark Trace and get started? Well, clearly, uh, we've got lots of use cases uh, and, and exploratory information available on the website, darktrace.com. Also, I'm happy to have conversations with folks on this call um, via LinkedIn or, or whatever method works best, or works best for you. Uh, love to just have a conversation and explore. And uh, how easy is it to get? Is it how easy is it to get started with Dark Trace to spin up an instance and, and explore how you can begin a journey with Dark Trace? Uh, it's probably less than an hour uh, just to configure up some some SaaS credentials and get started on that. We we like to to study and learn from a from an ML perspective for about seven days before we can really start looking at normal behaviors. Uh, so we offer you know thirty and sixty day trials on a number of our products to to let folks test drive it and see what it looks like with your own data. And you do have a new email uh, security uh, uh, offering. It's not particularly new. Um, it's, it's certainly taken off this year with, with the you know, increased risk and, the, and the, the attack patterns jumping into email and SaaS credentials. We've seen a large uptick uh, from our email product. It's doing really well uh, and we're really excited to see that. Great. Hey, JR, great to see you. Thanks again for your support and active involvement. And by the way, you can learn more about uh, Dark Trace in the HMG marketplace. Thanks, Hunter. Appreciate it. Great to see you. Have see a good you conference. soon. Take care. Thanks. Next up, we have Harry Mosley. Harry's the global CIO of Zoom. We're going to talk about the future of work and the new normal. Harry, great to see you. Hey, you know, let's, let's get into the content. You know, when you think about the challenges and the opportunities for businesses to work in this new home from home environment and then the soon hybrid environment. What are you thinking about, Harry? Yeah, I, I, you know, well, on a personal level, I love it. It's not, you know, before, you know, prior, prior to this coronavirus, I was on three or four flights a week, like many other professionals. And um, so this is like uh, been wonderful, you know, working you know, from my home, working from other places, and uh, it's been great. And uh, it doesn't work for everybody, but it works for millions of people. I think that sort of the, the bottom line on this, uh, Hunter, is that, you know, the, the facts are that people can actually work from home. They can actually work very productively from home. They can have a better work-life balance. Um, you know, the uh, employers really like the fact that people are working from home. They can reduce their real estate footprint. Uh, they can actually be geographically agnostic in terms of recruiting. They don't need to recruit in like New York City, as an example. They can recruit across the country. Um, there are challenges, of course, from a collaboration perspective and a culture perspective. And so you're absolutely right that it's going to be a hybrid model post pandemic where people will be working from home two to three days a week and working from an office, not, not particularly sort of in midtown Manhattan per se, because there's this new term that's popping up calling work, work, working near home. So there's a lot of companies now sort of talking about the, um, spinning up these uh, satellite offices uh, outside of the main area. Um, so that people can who don't have the right uh, accommodations in their home to work can actually go to an office local, so to speak. Excellent. You know, Harry, you've been at this for a long time, uh, three and a half CIO jobs into it. We've talked about your amazing career. And when you think about leadership in this day and age, sometimes you have to manage across three, four, five generations, keeping people connected. Um, it's a it's, it's challenge. Um, any thoughts on how best to to lead in this uh, in, in these challenging times? Yeah, so it's um, that's a great question. Um, uh, you know, everything has changed over the last eleven months. Um, nothing is the same. Uh, you know, it's the uh, notion that you know, sort of, you go back to January of this year as an example. Hunter, people had to work, request permission to work from home, and now they have to request permission to work from the office. So everything has changed. Retail has changed. Um, you know, manufacturing has changed um, and leadership has changed uh, from the perspective of, you know, we used to manage people, we used to manage them in the office. And now, uh, you know, it's like we're not managing the people per se, we're managing the work, we're managing the contribution. I really don't mind sort of, you know, people, we're not managing the schedule anymore. It's like people work when they choose to, it's all about the contribution. 
And so, uh, which, you know, sort of allows for people to have a more flexible life, a better work-life balance. But, you know, so the way, as a manager, the way you lead and manage now has dramatically changed. And trust is a huge, trust has always been important in the workplace, but now you're trusting your employees um, and, uh, you know, it's um, the, the, the metrics and the reports back that I hear from people around the world on this topic is it's like it's been a phenomenal experience you know trust is a huge item right it always has been but more more than ever now yeah absolutely yeah you know and and empowerment and then finding you know, finding what people are really good at and doubling down right helping people find what they're really passionate about as it relates to the mission of the organization mission of the company i mean you folks at zoom have an incredible culture right about passion and really loving your clients, right? We've, we've always been about um, sort of empowering people to, to accomplish more. And uh, that's, you know, sort of, and that's not like, you know, people, when they hear that statement, they think of like, yes, more meetings. No, it's not about more meetings. It's empowering medical professionals to treat patients so that patients can have a better life be able to better, have a better contribution. It's uh, em empowering, you know, retail stores to have virtual experiences with their customers and things of that nature. Um, so that's our, that's our culture and uh, yeah, that's, it's fun. So Harry, I recently at Zoomtopia had some new announcements. Do you want to talk a little bit about the on Zoom platform and what it means for business to business and business to consumer uh, scenarios? Absolutely. So, um, well, very clearly, you know, sort of when we go back to sort of March of this year, you know, uh, uh, organizations, companies, you know, sort of pivoted to a virtual world, you know, whether it's a yoga class, whether it's a baking class, whether it's, you know, a um, um, music lessons, what have you. Um, but, you know, many, many of these organizations don't have the uh, technical setup for the billings, the, set up, the scheduling, the, you know, the right orientation, etc. And so, uh, so we see, you know, we fundamentally believe that this uh, virtual world is going to continue post pandemic. The notion that, you know, somebody in New York can take a yoga class from an instructor in Bangalore, as an example, uh, is quite, you know, quite cool. I, it's like, you know, thinking about learning the piano and somebody referred to me about a instructor from Europe. It's like I could take, you know, so, so the world has become a lot flatter. Uh, the world has become a lot more connected. The world has become a lot smaller. And so the on Zoom, and then you, you you think about sort of like your events, Hunter, you know, which are awesome. You know, you can have a broader audience. Not only can you have a broader audience, you know, across the nation and across the globe, but you can have, you know, broader participation. You can bring in a speaker from, you know, Singapore or from Sydney. Right. Uh, it doesn't, you know, I, you know, so, so this, uh, you know, right now you're a hundred percent virtual. You used to be a hundred percent in person. So we fundamentally believe that in the future, there's going to be this hybrid model is going to be in everything, whether it's birthday parties or the HMG live events or yoga classes, it's going to, everything's going to be hybrid. And so we see that as an opportunity to leverage the platform. Let us take care of what we do really well and let you do what you do really well. Uh, we'll do all the back end, the, you know, the heavy lifting and the, the technology and the platform and the billing and all of those elements, scheduling, and you do what you do really well. So it's, you know, it's, uh, it'll be, it's gonna be fun. You know, Harry, it does come, come down to people, always does, and right, engaging people, engaging your team and engaging your organization. And when you think about it, you can literally now lead an organization around the world throughout the day and follow the sun, right? Yeah, so Hunter, there was you know, a day last week, I uh, did an interview in Frankfurt you know, sort of did a panel discussion or a key, it was a keynote, yes, a keynote in Tel Aviv, a bunch of client meetings here in New York and California and finished with a keynote in Japan. And guess what? I did it right, right here with a dog under my desk. Love it. Love it. Sounds great. You know, you've had an amazing year. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. uh, you really Zoom kind of saved the enterprise and saved mom and pop uh, this past Thanksgiving, right? Yes. Yes, it's uh, yeah, Thanksgiving was a very special day and uh, it's a very special day in the nation. It's a wonderful vacation because it, you know, sort of 
it a uh, you know it's a um, it's a, a national holiday that everybody gets to celebrate. Doesn't matter your background, doesn't matter what your religion is, doesn't matter what your nationality is. If you're in the U.S., you get to you know sort of enjoy Thanksgiving, and we took Thanksgiving global this year, so that was like pretty cool. Very cool stuff. You know, when you think of the future of the tech industry, Harry, uh, what are your ideas and strategies? Just one minute. Yeah, I think that, you know, sort of there's, um, you know, there's AI and AR and VR and ML and IoT. So these are five technologies I, I frequently think about. And we, you know, we're barely scratching the surface on these things. And so sort of we're starting to use AI now from a, from a security perspective, um, you know, to identify spam callers, identify people who potentially are joining a meeting that shouldn't be in the meeting and things of that nature, because, you know, uh people do silly things they post their meeting ids you know sort of in the public domain and uh so we're, we're using ai to identify you know if your meeting um uh meeting uh credentials have been posted in the in the public domain and then alerting you to that so to advise you that you know um, that your credentials have been uh, uh exposed so it's um good. so i think that these five technologies you know, we're going to, we're just scratching the surface and uh, we'll make a huge, huge change in the world to come. Harry, great to see you. Uh, congratulations on an amazing year and uh, uh, happy holidays. We'll see you after the first of the year. Sounds like a plan, man. Be good. Take care. Yes. Next up, we have Dutt Kalari. Dutt is the senior vice president officer. He's in the senior vice president office of the CIO and the senior vice president of global technology at Broadridge. Hey, Dutt, great to see you. Good seeing you too. Good afternoon, Hunter. How are you? I am excellent. Thanks for making it here. Uh, Dutt, you're one of uh, our uh, special guests here, one of our uh, one of the most interesting interviews, uh, a real industry thought leader. Uh, give us a little context of Broadridge for those folks that might not know who and what Broadridge does. Sure. One thing I want to confirm, I'm not a bot. <laughs> Second, my next hire could be a bot. Right. With that, Broadridge is a global fintech. Uh, we are a leading provider of technology and operations, communications, data and analytics for financial services. More than 5,000 brands entrust us to deliver their critical communications to their clients. There are firms that rely on us to process on an average of about $8 trillion of fixed income and equity securities on a day. And there are clients who look to us to provide visibility into their ETFs or exchange traded funds. About 95% of the ETF uh, assets and 90% of all long-term mutual fund assets look at us to provide them the visibility into the distribution of these funds. So. Broadridge is a global fintech, and we are proud to say that the financial services runs through us. Interesting times and uh, amazing uh, kind of a uh, role in uh, company. I love it. When you think about um, RPA uh, as it relates to your enterprise strategy um, and what you're using now and you're deploying now, give us a kind of a storyboard. Uh, tell, tell us a good story about what's working now and what's not. Sure. So. To give you an example, right? As, as I said, we have about $8, trillions, $8 trillion of fixed income equity securities that are traded on our platforms. A good portion of that data comes as unstructured data even today. So this is either an email or a phone call or a text message and what we did is we actually automated that process by creating a bot. We used UiPath as the technology platform and deployed bots to translate that particular data into a structured data, which reduced the time it takes to process. It increased my processing capacity and also reduced my errors otherwise introduced by human beings. That's a big accomplishment for us. And the ability to process more in lesser time is a critical or a key success factor for us. 
Now the question of what worked and what did not work, right? Uh, one thing that we learned in the process, Hunter, is not to fix a broken, broken process. You have to look at the underlying process, make changes to that particular process itself, and then automate it. Don't try to automate a broken process. That helped us a lot, right? The other thing is applying technology to a wrong type of process also may not be successful. So you have to understand what your critical path is, what your process decomposition is. And once you have that kind of understanding, applying a technology like robotic process automation or, or intelligent process automation becomes very effective. Hey, Dot, how did you know you were ready for this technology? And uh, what kind of buy-in did you need from the C-suite, the CEO and the line of business to give you air cover? Good question. So when we started looking at the bottlenecks in our current process and the frequency of defects that we are seeing in the existing process, that could be automated and are repetitive in nature, we knew that's a great candidate for us to implement robotic process automation. Now, if I can show a 30% improvement in my throughput and productivity, which puts of course pressure on the sales team to go sell more, that is a trigger for my executive teams to start thinking about making investments and say, why not? But of course, you know, we had to, we had to take into consideration as, as uh, JR said, you know, the, the, the security aspects of it, to make sure that we have the right kind of articulate, uh, orchestration put in place, right kind of security controls put in place. With all that, we did get the buy-in from, from our executive leadership that said, well, this gives me a scope to grow with minimal investments. You know, Doug, you seem to me to be extremely strategic and thoughtful in your approach. Let's go up a level in terms of your overarching uh, go-to-market business technology strategy. And this is a bit off script, so you don't have to answer the question if you don't want to. A little bit about your approach and how you align the technology roadmap to the business roadmap. Very good question, Hunter. See, at Broadridge, we said we will go to market as market segments, which means wealth management, investment management, capital markets and such, right? Now, when we are going to market as market, spe ma market specific segments, the horizontal approach that we took from a technology perspective will not work. For example, when we start talking about our global, you know, post-trade management platforms, we had to start looking at componentizing it, whether it is asset servicing, whether it is reconciliation, whether it is clearance, right? Now, my competitive landscape also is changing, Hunter. And when I say my competitive landscape is changing, while the traditional financial services or fintechs were my known competitors, I saw the emergence or the surge of these smaller fintechs that started componentizing the process and had the ability to offer a sliver of the process and the technology teams of my clients and even the business team said, I can get the best of the breed of these components and compile a solution. Why do I need to go for an end-to-end -end product from one company? That kind of triggered us to develop a technology strategy aligned to our business strategy to componentize, modernize, and start looking at it as everything as a service SaaS provider. That's how we are aligning our technology strategy to the business strategy to help business achieve their goals and enable our clients in a modern technology environment. Hey, hey that beautiful answer, love it. Thank you very much for addressing that so thoughtfully. We cover leadership and career ascent uh, in everything that we do here at HMG Strategy. You've had, an you've had an amazing career. What are some lessons learned in your career ascent uh, that you wanna share with uh, our audience today? Sure. See, as a technology leader, right? I believe that the software engineering or developing these systems is a faculty of mind, 
Okay. And when I say it's a faculty of mind, if as a leader, right, as, as the previous speaker talked about empathy enablement, right, if I can empathize with my teams and help minimize that baggage of emotions, the output will be perfect. I mean, again, perfect is relative. The output will be, the output can be maximized. Now, while empathizing with my teams, if I change my management or my leadership style from task management to outcomes management, layered with empathy, that kind of new age leadership for a digital age, I call it physical as I mentioned it to you last time, right? It's the state between the physical and the digital. And to achieve that state requires a new mode of thinking and a new mode of leadership, which is empathy, building a digital environment and making sure that you are managing the outcomes rather than managing the tasks and the process itself. Great stuff. You know, when you think of uh, really uh, solid uh, lessons learned, when you think about some of the learnings from your RPA uh, initiative and the implementation, uh, and benefits. In, anything you want to share with your uh, with our audience? Oh, absolutely. One clear benefit that we saw is absolutely operationally, the process, the ability to process higher volumes of transactions is is no doubt a clear winner there for us. Right, reducing the manual touch points, which ultimately can mitigate my operational risks. It can ease the process bottlenecks. Now think about it. A bot doesn't need bio breaks. A bot doesn't need to go home at the end of the day, which means working overnight, 24 hours around the clock, actually created more capacity in a hybrid environment. When I have a combination of a bot and human, I need more human power to make sure that the throughput of the bots is balanced and the work content is, the, the throughput of the work content is, is managed in such a way that we are not creating that as a bottleneck. These are some of the benefits. And some of the learnings, again, as I said previously, don't try to fix a broken process by throwing technology at it. Look at your fundamentals, look at your basic processes and make sure that you are correcting your process and deploying the technology because technology is only 30% of the overall equation. And the rest is people change the process. Fixing those will make effective application of, of technology. Second thing is credentializing your bots, making sure that your bots are either in attended mode or in an in, in unattended mode. How do you make sure that you are not you're guarding your bots or you're preventing your bots from going rogue within the environment. These are some of the new age challenges that the technology leaders and the CIOs will be facing. Creating that you know, integration with Active Directory, creating the right kind of credential, credentializing your bots are some of the best practices and learnings that we can share. Hey, Doug, great job. Really appreciate your coming on the program. Uh, thank you for your ongoing engagement. Uh, you're one of our top picks for a 2020 Top Tech Execs That Matter uh, Recognition Awards. We'll, we'll circle back to you on that. Uh, good to see you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Happy holidays. Happy holidays to you too, Hunter. Great. Next up, we have Reimagining the Business and the Future of Work. I want to bring up uh, on the stage first, Pat Phelan. Pat is the VP of Market Research at Rimney Street. Remedy is doing some amazing work with partners around the world. Uh, Pat, uh, good to have you on the program. When you think of IT is, increase, is uh, seeing an increase in demand from business to deal with all of the pandemic that is delivered in terms of business model changes, how do you reconcile the pandemic financial pinch with innovation? Right, right. So, you know, the financial services sector has been hit a little differently than many uh, other sectors. 
it, depending on the group that you're in, your your impact may be a little more or a little less, and your need to innovate. You, uh, we've seen some some organi some groups of financial services be, uh, you know, farther along the path. When I think of banking. There's a lot of user facing digital work already happening. I think of um, um, say uh, investment management. You know, they haven't had uh, quite so much need to be out on the bleeding edge of digital. And um, but what we're finding is that many organizations are seeing an extreme slowdown in their project like work. And, and yet at the same time, they still have to keep the lights on while the business is asking them to make some very rapid changes in order to stay um, viable and relevant. So we see that, that increase in demand from the business. Um, and we also see that financial pinch happening. So what we're finding is that organizations, and we see this a lot here at Romini Street, we're seeing that organizations are being pressured to uh, squeeze to squeeze their IT budgets so that they can free up money to put where they have to rapidly invest right now. And I think that's going to happen at least through 2021. So big projects that don't bring a lot of um, ROI, like like I pick on ERP refreshes because that's the most obvious in in my sector. But you know, if that's not going to ch change your ability to engage with customers, if that's not going to improve your ability to reach new markets, those kind of projects are being put on hold. While projects that increase ability to work from home, increase ability to open the door to new prospects, customers, partners, those are the projects where we're seeing a lot of. Uh, of things happen. And there's something else I'm seeing. I, I haven't written about it yet, but um, I'm, I'm expecting to see this at least uh, through the first half of next year and perhaps all next year. And that is businesses that haven't really used, I'll call it retail-like um, systems in the past, order entry, customer uh, relationship management, businesses that have been very high touch personal come in the door are going to see investments in retail like um, systems, online order entry, online customer service, online with digital uh, interactions. So I would be surprised if uh, companies that aren't doing this already, uh, I would be surprised if they don't perk up their ears and start thinking about how can we leverage from the retail sector into the financial services sector to make ourselves more digital, uh, digitally available. That's a big thing I see. Excellent. And, and Pat, you guys, you folks at Rimini Street have a big uh, practice uh, in uh, FS, right? We do. I, I'm thinking 20 of the top uh, clients out of the top, um, as an industry 100, industry 500 group, we've got a fair number of, of organizations have turned to us. And it's, of course, there's a cost savings factor there, but more so to free up to their, these, cap, these captured funds and resources so that they can refocus them. I'm not gonna say pivot, but they can refocus those um, resources on something that absolutely has to be taken care of now in order to um, uh, improve their resiliency or um, uh, thrive in the environment that we're in. Thanks, Pat. And of course, you guys have incredible high uh, satisfaction scores, unlike the others. There's a pop-up poll. If you folks, you could uh, vote on that. What is your top concern about ERP vendor support? That would be great. Probably it's going to be high cost, I would guess, or poor support or a combination of both. Pat, we'll circle back to you here in just a minute. Next up, we have Mel Reyes. Mel, great to see you. Great to see you, Hunter. Thank you for inviting me. Mel's the VP of IT Enterprise Credit Program Manager at 17B Financial Services Company, uh, based out of where now, Mel? Uh, I'm in Calabasas, California. Yep. Good, good for you, man. You have an amazing career at uh, Bank, of, Bank of America, Smith uh, City, uh, Smith Barney, Bankers Trust. When you think about the big issues today, what are the, what are the key areas that you're focused in on right now? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, Fred Harris threw out a question on the uh, in the chat, and it's it's one of those hotbeds. Is you know automating compliance, right? And that that whole tree of of pieces is one of those key areas, and you know um, the controls around that, right? So when you're looking at financial services regulations and 
all of the great advancements that we've made in the last eight months, uh, um, you, you know, you still have those lingering issues. Um, I was on a call yesterday with uh, Rick Dotton, who's one of the primary uh, writers and contributors to the CIS, you know, cybersecurity framework uh, and the controls. And one of the pieces that he brought up is that he's actually trying to add assessments and the compliance into the controls as a standard. Um, you, you get you get every industry um, making educated guesses to their compliance components and and a lot of other pieces. And when you get into regulations, um, you've got you've got uh, the obvious you know reg components that that uh, banking and financial services have to deal with, but then you also have HIPAA and then you've got all these other, you know, matrix uh, frameworks that you can crosswalk, but they're, you know, the, the level of um, engagement that you need from both your GRC groups and everywhere, everyone else becomes very difficult. So the automation of that, uh, how do you get all of these layered, you know, uh, security vector tools to bubble up into an automated system so that you can, you know, spend less time trying to track and trace and uh, is, is one of those key areas that's going to bubble up even more because as uh, uh, Satish said, you know, we need to do more uh, uh, you know, pen testing, and you know, as, as Jr. said, more you know, more testing throughout the year, right? It's not just once a year anymore. You have to be very vigilant about all these things. So to do that, you need to be able to collect that information. That's one of those hotbeds that I've been dealing with across a, a few clients and across a few areas that uh, that I've been working with. Um, and you know, to be honest with you, I'm going to give you a plug for your book because you actually covered it in your author notes. Um, the the myriad of the rest of the things that you know um, uh, that you talk about in Future State 2025. Um, and this is why I love coming to these is because you actually have your finger on the pulse of everything. And you know, the guests have spoken to it. Um, you know, you talk about being courageous. You talk about being authentic, right? Um, you know, and and you know, <clears throat> I think for me. Satish hit it on the nose when he talked about EQ, right, um, from the top down. But there's also views of, you know, uh, uh, social uh, views of social design and design thinking from the bottom up, right? So you can reorganize and self-organize, especially now with this distributed, you know, environments that we have, right? I've been a big proponent of, you know, uh, you know all of the wonderful theories of like Brian Tracy and everyone else on, you know, getting teams to, to be able to contribute and everything else. Um, that's the most important thing right now. We have a distributed environment. We have the fatigue. We have a lot of other things that are going through. We have to be able to empower. And, and you, I mean, your summary was was just spot on, right? That that first intro. If I closed the book, I would have been just happy at that page. But the rest of it was fantastic. And I think that's one of those things that um, really does take. Uh, the courage, right? You've got to be authentically unapologetic about the changes that you have to make in your organization at any scale, top down, bottom up. And I think that's one of those things that everyone is seeing with EQ and the changes. Hey, Mel, so many other areas. Mel, I love it. And thanks for the compliment, the plug for the book. Buy many of the books for the holidays and give them to all of your friends, relatives, no, just to your teammates, your line of business and the C-suite. But I'll circle back to you here in just a minute. Thanks yeah. again. Uh, next up, we have Roger Hale. Roger is the CSO of Big ID. Roger, hey, welcome to the summit and the program. Tell us a little bit about Big ID. Thanks, Hunter. Uh, Big ID is a data analytics platform that um, we came out um, and we, we are still in that startup phase. We're about four years old, four, four and a half years old. Uh, came out with the idea of focusing because of all the interest around privacy. Um, but expanded beyond privacy um, fully into helping people understand and then be able to take action on what data they have, where, it, where they have it, and uh, at what risk does that actually bring to you. So the, the risk component, the being able to identify dark data across your systems, understanding where that information is going. Uh, we feel that we can help address especially the challenges with companies that have gone to a disparate workforce that were more of a localized or a, you know, more of a office-based workforce in the beginning as we help them understand exactly where that information and risks are. You, when you think about uh, Big ID, four years old, that's great. Um, any uh, uh, experience in FS uh, clients yet? We do, we actually do have a, have a number of clients um, in, in the financial services area. 
Um, I'm not, I'm not going to name names and, and, and sure. start throwing out logos, of course, but um, we're working with different financial services across the board, especially where they have um, compliance regulations around um, understanding where their customer data is and ensuring the protection of it but also in understanding the impact of their employee data, how it's operating and helping them visualize the business process flows of how they operate as a company and help, help be able to automate that process and distill that into um, decisions to be able to make, make, uh, make, take action and improve their posture. Of course, you can scale. Scale matters in FS, right? Oh, absolutely. And, and that, that we, we love that question of, um, you know, can you handle my data stores? And uh, we really like our, our, our vanity um, uh, PowerPoint deck that shows the different types of data stores that we reach across on-prem hybrid and cloud solutions. Because that is the goal of if we can't reach the data stores for a company, we can't give them that visibility that they need. And so the, the, that saturation is, is the critical point of what we can do. And Roger, what would you say would be the one word that would distill the opportunity and challenges, challenges of pivoting in today's operating environment? Enablement. Um, enablement is really critical. And you've heard this a couple of times already on the theme this morning, you know, whether it's from the term of empathy, um, you know, considering how th this works, but across the organization from um, your interactions with your customers to the interactions with your staff, to being able to, to set up both for success, your customers and your internal staff as well, um, to enable them to operate in an environment where now they find themselves, you know, some people in the garage at their homes, you know, trying to operate. Uh, and, and all the, not just the technical, but the actual business process that goes into that um, to, you know, deal with, with those people that are phenomenal employees, you never want to lose them. However, they may, may not have the ability to have the greatest internet connection at their home. And so, so being able to enable how your business processes are understanding um, how you need to make adjustments. And um, first and foremost is user experience. I know that normally you don't hear that coming out of the security guy of talking about user experience, but the only way we're gonna be able to enable the business model is by helping with the solution to operate the way people are need to operate today. Thanks so much. Stay with us. We'll circle back to you in just a minute there, Roger. Next up, we have uh, Snail Antani. Snail is co-founder and CEO of Horizon 3 AI, uh, say a little bit about uh, Horizon 3 AI, what's uniquely different in the marketplace and what about security tools and practices to operate in this borderless environment in this new world? What are you, what are you thinking about? Yeah, so um, so kind of my background uh, real quick. So I was a CIO at GE Capital, spent time as a member of the CIO community here within HMG, 10 plus years now with you, Hunter. Uh, and so I've had that that I've been in the seat where we are accountable for cybersecurity, we're accountable for digital transformation, we're accountable for our people and so on. And my big epiphany and realization is modern attacks are 80% of modern attacks don't use vulnerabilities or malware. And that really surprised me when you look at attacks in 2020 versus attacks in say 2015 or 2010. Yet the bulk of my time as a CIO was spent on vulnerability management programs uh, malware detection programs, and so on. So organizations are designed to stop yesterday's attack. And that really catches me off guard. And when you think about it, $10 billion of financial loss over the last five years, uh, using uh, $10 billion of loss where the attacks used valid user IDs and passwords, where probably at least one of your employees' corporate email password is their Netflix password. And so what we have is a fundamental shift in attack profiles and behavior. So with my CIO hat on, how do I defend those attacks? How do I react to those attacks? And how do I know that I actually can or not? And what we have is this failure of looking at our environment through the eyes of the attacker and using that attacker's perspective to find our blind spots, to find our ineffective tools, policies, and policies, and training like we fight where we're exercising our reaction time and improving our posture. And the reason why it's been very difficult is uh, activities like penetration testing and red teaming has been a very consultant heavy manual exercise that is expensive, that covers a small slice of your environment. What we wanted to try to do is think of, uh, think Twilio for pen tests, meaning something as easy to use as a single API or a single self-service user interface 
to be able to run something as complicated as a full pen test against your environment. What we do is pen testing as a service. Our customers go from running one pen test a year to three pen tests a week. And they're able to, as a result, find problems, fix them, verify they've been fixed. And they end up in this cycle of continuous assessments and uh, continuous exercising. And so that's the problem we're trying to get to solve. Once again, turn the map around, look at your environment through the eyes of the attacker. Uh, and having been in the seat, I know how painful that is, but also how valuable it is if you can get it right. How relevant do you think Horizon 3 AI would be to the financial services uh, vertical? It, so what's interesting in the market is there's probably three groups of three groups of or segments of customers to deal with. The first are those that that recognize they are defending yesterday's attacks. And these tend to be those early adopters of cybersecurity products. They tend to cut across many industries, healthcare, retail, insurance. It's very personality driven. Like we know the personalities that tend to be aggressive. Mel is one of them, right? Very thoughtful and forward thinking in his cybersecurity view of the world. And, and we're able to, to, to work closely with them. The second segment of customers that are those that have to do it. Financial services, healthcare, retail, and others by compliance regulation have to run security assessments or PCI compliance, HIPAA compliance. So how do they use us to, to meet those requirements better, faster, faster, cheaper? And that's the second segment. The third segment of security people I find are what I call the ostriches. They don't want to know about threats in their environment because they don't want to be held accountable and they just want to stick their heads in the sand. And for them, I basically say, um, good luck. I will wait for you to get breached and fired and then we'll deal with your replacement. Thanks, Snell. Stay with me. I'll circle back to you in just a minute. Great job. Hey, Pat, you're up next. When you think of cloud, um, most every organization, every enterprise is looking at uh, in, going to the cloud or they're in the cloud. What are the gotchas? What, what should they be looking out for? Well, um, I'm glad you asked because there's a lot going on right now and a lot of lessons being learned. And several of the folks, I think Roger mentioned it, Mel, and then uh, one of the earlier speakers mentioned the concept of process and automating processes. You know, when you're moving something to the cloud, every process that you have today may not be a good candidate to operate in a digital environment. So yes, the technology issues are there. Yes, you gotta figure out how to secure it. And boy, are those big um, um, tasks, but you've also gotta do some, um, some uh, self, uh, I'm gonna think of here, uh, realization and, and really look at, is there value in putting process X in the cloud? And then the next big challenge is, if I put it in the cloud, will it work the same way? So that looking at yourself from the eyes of your, your um, attackers, also look at yourself from the eyes of your customers, partners, and um, um, suppliers. If I move something to a, a digital environment, when I go to the cloud, I've got to make sure that the way I do things today either doesn't change or does change if it has to work differently. So when you start to think about that, then the other issues start to fit in. Well, functionally, are the, is the fit of the cloud product that's available, especially in SaaS, um, going to serve my needs? And when you think about ERP and these systems that have been around for 30 some years, there's a lot of feature richness in there. And it takes a long time, and plus you've customized, right? <laughs> and it takes a long time to, to replicate or duplicate or reinvent that in a, in a SaaS product. And we're still early days with, with uh, enterprise applications being into SaaS. So if, once you get the processes sorted out, then there's a cloud a solution that will fit the process that you need. And then of course there's integration. The more, in, the more cloud partners you have, the more your integration risk goes up. In fact, we're writing about that right now. Um, and the more the competency of integration becomes a priority in your business, um, then there's the, the, once you get past integration, then you've got to deal with all of the, the data aspects of it. Well, where, where's the single port of entry for a given piece of data when you've got multiple cloud providers or multiple SaaS providers? And it just goes on from there. And, and most organizations, when you start moving things to the cloud, it doesn't all go overnight. So you're going to find as a company, you'll be in a hybrid model for some period of time, maybe many years, maybe forever. Some things non-cloud, some things in the cloud, and then how do you operationally manage that? So that that's a big chunk that needs to be worked out before you just 
think about when I'm throwing things to the cloud. So there's a lot of organizational shift that has to happen in addition to the process and the technology and the security and the integration. Excellent. Hey, Pat, thanks so much. Stay with me. I'll be back to you in just a minute. Hey, Mel, you're up next. What trends do you see uh, in tech now and what's on your shopping list? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. You, you, uh, a lot of the, the calls that you've held, um, I've talked about them, right? Uh, here, you know, Edge, IoT. And if you just take those aside, you know, um, I think the, the ones that are most important for me, one of the ones that are most important to me, and as we, as we kind of look through uh, what we're doing, is uh, effectively um, solving the problem that, that Sneha just talked about is one of them, right? Is, upskilling and reskilling your current staff so that you avoid those 80% of the issues, which are typically misconfigurations and education, right? So everybody's doing an educational piece in their, in their systems, um, in, their, in their companies, but it's really about kind of taking that and tying it to that EQ and the rest of the, 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 the changes that, that are happening right now uh, about reskilling. Um, 50% of folks polled in a, an article I just posted said um, they don't get enough training or their careers have been stalled or uh, regressed, right? And this is the time when we've got the attention of management. We've got, you know, you know how, do you, how do you target the employees uh, technically and otherwise um, to, to take advantage of that? And I think if I, if I put the logistical human aspect aside, the rest of it becomes things like what Dutch said is, you know, is leveraging as a service uh, across the board, lending as a service, banking as a service, looking at um, open banking and being open to that. And again, aggressively, unapologetically and courageously, you know, tapping into those. Um, RPA is great and it has all its functions. At this point, it's, I think it's at a maturity state where it's commodity. So now we just have to look at deep learning, AI, and then how do we kind of build out those catalysts, uh, you know, through uh, uh, services. Excellent, Mel. Thanks so much for coming on. Great to see you and your spot on. Appreciate the, the plug for the book again as well. Uh, you know, back up to Roger. Hey, Roger, when you think of uh, today's operations, uh, a dis distributed work from anywhere scenario, will technology hubs like Silicon Valley and Seattle and New York keep their attraction? Or is this the new reality, new normal, as Harry mentioned? You, you know, I, I, I think I think that there, there's two sides to that coin, right? I think there's always going to be that attraction of community. Um, but what we're seeing this year, especially in, in 2020, is that community is, is more and more a digital community. So uh, I'm, I'm actually in the Austin area, so we're a little bit of a technology hub down here. Uh, but it falls back to, do I have the tools to do the job? And, and do I have the skill set myself to operate in a remote, remote process against we'll operate in a, a more collaborative or more you know, team type environment. And so I see an opportunity for tech to actually step in on this to be able to give us, you know, as I was speaking to a person, a person yesterday in the industry that said, we really could use some great whiteboarding tools to actually really be go, go digital and really bring these communities together and share that out more. Um, to I think you're onto something there, by the way, I agree. I, I think I'm going to start investing in it right now. Yeah. Uh, but the, the, I think the opportunity now, and, and I've talked to my peers about this, there is, it is more distributed. Our relationships are being able to handle and our concepts are you know, tied more, our, our change of our process into more of a social media type process and that type of interaction um, is what we have to learn to, inter, to um, input into our business process. And with that, that will spread out that environment more, that'll expand more, and that'll give these other areas more of an opportunity for an economic growth within the tech market that has been more limited at this point in time. Excellent. Hey, Roger, great to have you on the program. How can people get in touch with you or the folks at Big ID? BigID.com. We're on all over the social media. Myself, I'm happy to talk to you. I literally am about to throw out um, my personal email at, at Roger H at Big ID or uh, on Twitter at Hale Roger. Maybe share it in the chat. That's great. Thanks so much for coming on the program. Hey, Thanks. Snail, final word, uh, top three things people should be working on thinking about right now uh, in this innovation cycle in this pandemic. Um, uh, good question. So I, I know two off the bat. So the first is that think of how much of commerce in our economy is based on relationships, whether it's trying to raise fund, funding from venture capitalists, that's a relationship you cultivate over time. 
trying to close a deal from a software standpoint or product, you're selling deals one steak dinner at a time as you build those relationships. Or the relationship between your, your uh, storefront and the customer themselves. And that's a very much a relationship and brand driven thing. In this new world, it is incredibly difficult to cultivate and nurture relationships. And so we have to fundamentally rethink core business processes that have been unassailed for decades, if not longer. And I think you're gonna see that companies capable of adapting to forming relationships through new channels and techniques, or those that cultivated meaningful relationships prior to the pandemic have the advantage. This will be very difficult for new relations to be built in, in current techniques and how we operate. So that's number one. Um, and that I think affects business model, that affects go to market, that affects your priority of customer experience. That's a really big area. And I think that's gonna make or break companies. That's gonna make or break startups. Startups that hired tons of sales reps to close deals one state dinner at a time are all struggling because they've got a bunch of reps that can't meet their quotas. Companies, startups that, or companies that built sales processes optimized for COVID are the ones that have less burn and able to, to make their numbers. The second big issue is with my CIO hat on, digital transformation, um, obviously we've seen the urgency to transform now, but building widgets and building apps, that's the easy part. It's not about cranking out new code that, that drives transformation. It's that last mile middle manager or military, that last mile commander, that, that uh, captain, uh, major, lieutenant colonel, that company commander, that troop commander, or in business or industry, it's that senior manager or director. If they're not bought in, if they have an analog mindset, or if they don't have enough time and capacity to both run their unit and change their unit, they are not going to transform. And you might have brilliant strategy. You might have brilliant centers of excellence that are cranking out widgets. But if you don't effectively engage and empower and enable that last mile of leadership in your command or in your organization, that, that I said, that director of mid-level management folks, the transformation you drive won't be sustainable or enduring. And hey, I think we're starting to- We gotta cut it off at that, there, but how can people get in touch with you? Um, Horizon3.ai is the company. I'm a local celebrity on LinkedIn. Uh, not as big a celebrity as, as Mel or you, but we're, I'll, I'm getting there. I'm building up. Um, uh, you know, uh, Sahal and Tani on, on LinkedIn is probably the best way to do it. Check out Horizon 3. Sahal, great to see you. Thanks so much. Take care. Uh, next up, we have Crisis and Career Preparing for the Next Opportunity. Susan Saratoma, Board Director, Executive Leader, and Strategic Advisor of Point to Point. Uh, Susan, welcome to the program. You're going to lead the panel. All right. Thank you for having me. So we're going to... Uh be part of one of the most interesting discussions, uh, which is about our CTOs and CIOs in the future. So it's crisis and career and preparing for our next opportunity. We have three amazing panelists. We have David Morris, we have Chuck Gray, and I am hoping to see Phil Schneidermeyer on here, but uh, hopefully he will join in a moment. So let me just start with uh, an intro for each of our panelists, David Morris, uh, founder and chairman and CEO of Hyper Solutions. And David has spent his career, I love this, researching and empowering leaders to transform their teams, their companies and their careers. His passion is to identify high impact performers and help them reach greater success through a hybrid of tech driven platforms and experience based advisory. So welcome, David. Chuck, I've had the privilege to know uh, over uh, several years now. Chuck Gray is a partner in the New York office of Egon Zender and he's the chief information officer's practice on the East Coast. He brings deep expertise in chief information officer searches across numerous industries, including financial services and many others. So welcome, Chuck. Um, and I am not sure right now if we have Phil. Phil, are you out there? No. Okay, so let's, uh, let's kick it off at this point and we can always then go in. I really wanna just start this discussion with a quote that most people know from James Lane Allen. And it is adversity doesn't build character, it reveals it. 
And COVID is a crisis that has revealed the value and the character of our tech leaders. And so today's discussion is going to be about, you know, what is the next thing and how has the role of the CIO CTO changed? Uh, so let's just start uh, with David and just a basic question. What are the characteristics that have been demonstrated during COVID by CTOs who have been successful, right? We've seen them move up the corporate hierarchy. So what are your thoughts? Thanks, Susan. I think it's self-awareness and, you know, credit to Tony on this. It's, it's looking in the mirror and saying, what are you good at? Uh, you've probably heard, we've talked about a few archetypes, you know, not all CTOs are the same. Some are just really, really good technical. They're very good experts. Uh, you know, others are uh, really good promoters. You know, they're focused on their social media, their followership, branding. Uh, they're very good at relationship building. Uh, and others are trusted advisors, the ability to really interact with the business uh, and, and really problem solve. And I think, don't try to be all three. Really think about where your zone of genius is and then really make sure that you have a lieutenant, a number two, uh, as well as an air cover that collectively you're the game changing team. Don't try to do it all yourself. Really triple because authenticity is key and you just got to figure out what your best at. Okay, Chuck, your view on that. I mean, those are all great points. And by the way, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, yes. You know, what, what, what I say is like, if I think about you know a decade ago as I, I was getting into this business, so much of the focus was on mobile applications then it became a focus on cloud. And then it became a focus on AI and ML. And then it became a focus of, then it became a focus of, oh my gosh, we got to move all of our workforce remote in like two weeks <laughs> and, and on and on and on, right? And so this role has transformed probably as much as any other C-level role over the last decade, just as far as what you need to be good at. And so what we see for those people who can endure change management is actually first of all curiosity is important because things are constantly evolving you know change management is super important because there's always a change agenda or say different usually there is a change agenda in the company and if so the CIO is a huge part of that uh, and then the last thing I'll say is just good old-fashioned resilience you're going to get knocked down you're going to get your uniform dirty quite a bit in, in this role and you got to be able to just keep getting up and, and going to the next thing as we think about getting past the COVID crisis, right? There's been a huge tectonic shift. And anytime there's a shift like that, right? There's a new normal and new leadership styles are needed. Uh, so how can, you know, what is that new profile? What is the CIO or CTO post COVID going to look like and drive these companies so Chuck, why don't you kick it off? I was hoping David would go first. No, I'm just kidding. Hey <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Chuck, by the way, actually, I just want to make a side comment on that and, and, and uh, for, the, uh, for the recent panelist who was talking about relationships. I think this relationship thing is, I just can't echo that enough. It's certainly one of the components, but it's sort of like Chuck, you know, we met a few times at different events, Chuck, and it feels like it's been no time. It's just good to see you. And it's just this concept that you either have the relationship before or somehow you need to be able to form these relationships really quickly and authentically digitally. Uh, and I, I just can't echo enough of what that last panelist just said. Uh, and I feel that, Chuck, with you here. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. It's good to see, it's good to see both of you, actually. It's been a while. I wish that we were all in person together. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I mean, look, if, if you, I mean, things just move so fast now. And so I just think, I hate to say it, it sounds so simple, but speed is just going to become such an important part of what people do. I was talking to CIO back at the beginning of this pandemic, and she was telling me how she, they workforce for 20,000 people, so 20,000 person workforce. I think she said roughly 3,000 of the people could work remotely. Within two weeks, everybody could work remotely. <laughs> right? You know, I was talking to a CIO of a, a divisional CIO of a bank who said all of 2019, they processed 400 small business applications, small business loan applications. Once all the legislation came out, they processed like 30,000 in two weeks. 
<laughs> right? Like just how quickly you have to scale is just on a whole other dimension right now. And people that can do that and just adjust, that's going to be super critical going forward. Okay. So David, how do people prepare themselves for these high impact roles? There is a, a model um, that came out of this book, The Hero's Journey, uh, which so many movies have followed this same uh, path. Uh, I feel, uh, you know, and and it, it's it's all about stories, right? And whether it's Harry Potter, whether it's Star Wars, all of these, so many movies follow the same pattern where the hero, the hero is what we call reluctant hero. They're not raising their hand for the role. And Chuck, I know we'll have additional perspective on this on the hiring front, but this is the thing we've been coaching our clients. And that is, you know, when you get tapped on the shoulder, when you get a call from the recruiter, when you're meeting with, you know, a potential board member you may work for, you got to let them sell you on the role. You got to say, I don't even know if I'm the right person. <laughs> and why would you want me? And if I do join, this is what I need. This is what I need because the CIOs that don't have air cover, they don't have the support, they don't have the resources, they're just not going to work. So I think negotiating that up front and, you know, it's not a playing hard to get, but it's authentically saying, can you be successful in this new role and what do you need? And that's what we have found, like, even in the movies, like the heroes are not usually raising their hand wanting the role. Chuck, I'm just wondering what other, um, how you might also uh, package what I just mentioned, um, because it just feels like if you don't have that support or air cover, you're not going to be successful. So how do you get it before you even accept the role? I mean, look, it's, it's a great question. And, um, you know, when we, whenever we take on a search for a, a C-level role, especially a CIO role, I mean, it, it's really important that we spend time with the management team. You know, specifically, I, you know, the C, whoever the hiring manager is, ideally the CEO. And then we actually try to talk to a couple of the peers as well. And what we're trying to do as part of that is, number one, we're trying to figure out, you know, what is this role going to solve for? Because there's usually some business challenge that the role is solving for. But the other part is we're trying to get a sense for the culture and what type of obstacles or opportunities a person is gonna have once they get into the role. And so part of how you solve for it, in our opinion is, like sometimes the focus is so much on the hiring manager and that's super important, don't get me wrong, that's super important. But you also need to understand kind of, some people, people get tripped up as you know, and it could be high school, it could be running a big company or whatever and everything in between. If the people who are your peers don't have your back and are supportive because we all work in teams today anyway, uh, the person won't be successful. So I, I, that's something we really look at uh, and something we really push our clients to give us that exposure to the rest of the management team so they can really, really be a good advisor to them and help those CIOs be successful. Phil, welcome. Uh, glad you could join us. And so let me just, uh, you know, introduce Phil. Phil Schneidermeyer, I have known for many, many years. And uh, he is currently managing director of the CIO Search Group, an executive search firm specializing in infotech, cyber, and engineering. But Phil has over 25 years of experience in executive search across all industry sectors. And uh, we are so excited that you are able to join us today. Um, what we were talking about is really given what's happened in the world over the last 10 months or so, uh, what are the characteristics of successful CIO CTOs during this time of crisis? And then what's the profile of the person who uh, everyone is going to be looking for in that role post COVID? Well, well thank you, Susan, I appreciate the uh opportunity to join everyone and uh, my thanks to Hunter as well and my apologies for uh, not being here on time. G a great question. I won't use the word timely, obviously timely. And I, I'm not sure what my, my peers have shared around this already. So if I'm repeating, I'll, I'll apologize. Um, I think a couple, of, uh, a couple of terms come to mind. Disruption, right? 
uh, you can't get much more disruptive than uh, than we've all experienced in in 2020. But uh, I think at least for the candidates that uh, executives we all work with, they they've been through disruption in the past. At least if they're in the seat they are today, they've been through disruption, and you can fill in the blank, digital or however you want to think about disruption. Uh, and and the other the other term that comes to mind is is nimble. Right. I mean, my gosh, we've we ought to be if we're going left in the morning, we ought to be able to go, you know, right by the afternoon because uh, that's where the world is. Uh, the world's going to take us. So, so those are a couple. And uh, and and so, on. in terms of uh, thinking about, uh, you know, the the profile, and you know, obviously we're talking about financial services here today. You know, an industry that's been disrupted re repeatedly, right? And and everyone here can articulate that better better than I. Versus some of the other areas I work in, for example, you know, working in in nonprofit. You know, not that it's, you know, uh, it, it it can be transformative, and you can ask transformative not not for profits, but I don't think their uh, their business, their industry, and so forth is being as disrupted as maybe as we think about some some other vertical. Uh, verticals. Next question is one of my favorites. Um, I can't claim ownership for the question, but uh, I have experienced this as being a, uh, someone who's taken CIO and CEO roles that were said to be for transformations. And uh, earlier in my career, it was so exciting when I heard that. And then later in my career, I would say, are you sure? Or no, you don't want someone to transform because it's hard. And so I think the next question is very important for CIOs and CTOs today is what's the best way to figure out if a company is serious when they say they want to transform, especially this whole era of digital transformation. So David, let's start with you. You know, this whole digital transformation is just, it's, it's a fascinating term to me because it's like, a, you know, we have Airbnb out today, what, 115% uh, of our IPO price. And, you know, what we see uh, with DoorDash yesterday, uh, you know, it just, I, I think, um, taking the question slightly differently, it's just this concept of just digital first and that's how the CEO needs to be thinking first. So again, just going back to the earlier points on CIO is how do you fit into a world where the CIO has to be the head of, the CEO has to be head of digital. So the question just is what is the CIO's role and how do they fit to be part of that team? Okay. Phil, do you have uh, some thoughts? Yeah, no, th thanks, Susan. And, you know, David, I jump right in and, you know, I agree with you. And I think it aligns well with the comments you were making before and so forth. Um, I, I just had a recent experience where, um, unfortunately, the CIO was only, uh, the, the term was less than about 18 months. And I think the reason that she decided the fit really wasn't uh, a good one uh, is because, I, I guess, to your point, David, about, you know, doing your due diligence up front. You know, maybe she did or maybe she didn't, but it was clear when she came on board while everyone was talking about transformation and transformation on innovation, digital and so forth, the CIO didn't necessarily own that. Uh, it was being driven or owned or, you know, it's not a word I, I necessarily care for, but, you know, even her ability to influence um, just wasn't there. And that's by virtue of those who came before her and the responsibilities and so forth that they had and why it didn't come through in the interview, uh, you know, uh, process, I, I don't know. But um, yeah, and, and she's, you know, if you think about, you know, I just kind of think about, you know, a continuum of, you know, 100% operations, maybe on one side, 100% transformation and changes on, on the other side, I, I think, um, it seems to me that, you know, while the pendulum swings all the time for all of these variables, I don't know, David and Chuck, what you're seeing in the market, but it, it feels like to me that we're, we're landing somewhere in the middle and but still leaning for the transformation side. You, you know what I'm saying? You know, you can't give up all of the, I hate to say keep the lights, but, you know, all of these other aspects that are very important just to think you're going to bring in the digital transformation change agent and then somehow or other, everything else is going to be going to be okay. And not everybody fits that mold, right? And they don't see themselves in that mold. And it certainly doesn't sell when you're talking about 
infrastructure versus versus digital. Okay. So, um, Chuck, if, uh, if you have some other points, otherwise, um, you know, I have a uh, another angle to ask you about. Please ask your other angle. I know we're getting shorter in time, so why don't we go okay. there? So um, traditionally, right, the CIO or CTO role, that was the pinnacle of a tech person's career. But we see that changing. And recently, one of the big executive recruiting firms came out with a survey uh, that said that 51% of the CIOs want to go uh, to the next level and be a CEO, although only 12% thought that they were ready immediately. So what do you see the trajectory now for the CIO CTO? And what have you seen a change in the way that CEOs think about uh, that role? Man, that's a big one. Uh, so look, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, look, it, it, it it's, I mean, look, the, the, the role, I mean, this is the happiest time ever to be doing this type of work because the profile of the CIO CTO is the, is the best it's ever been. You know, these roles are getting reporting to the CEO more and more ever, more and more these days. This person is getting a tremendous amount of exposure to the board of directors. This, these, these executives are actually getting on boards of directors, which used to not happen. So the profile of the role has increased. As you might expect, as the profile of the role increases, people are probably saying, hey, you know, maybe I could do something in addition to being a CIO. There are some folks who just love building stuff and they, they're going to be CIOs and CTOs the rest of their career and that's okay. But there are some who say, look, maybe I can be a chief operating officer. Maybe I could be a CEO one day. Um, we, you know, we, we've, um, you know, a guy who I've met before is a guy named Greg Carmichael, who's the CEO of Fifth Third Bank. You know, he was a CIO early in his career. And he had a nice steady career progression. And I say, if you want to get to the CEO title, it's usually not going to go be direct, right? You're going to have to maybe have a PL role. Maybe that's a smaller scale and kind of work your way up a different track. So it's out there. I'm sorry for the glare behind me. It's out there. You just have to, um, you know, be thoughtful about it and plan a bit and take some stretch roles that you might have taken before. Thank you, David. How would you like me to build on that? Uh, what, what <laughs> uh, I think basically it's what, you know, he, uh, Chuck talked about um, taking on a role like a PL head or some other role in the interim. And I see hunters come up for a time check. But um, so are there other types of you know, preparing that CIOs can do to get to that point. Yeah, it's outside boards. I mean, let's just look at this financially. Let's just put numbers straight on the table. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about Airbnb specifically and a good friend of mine that was involved as an advisor early on, all equity. Think about how much money he made on the side, on the side. So he, here's what I would say. What I would say is there were so many early stage companies, Series A, Series B, that would love to have you as a board member. Get on a couple board seats over there. You get to know the VCs. There's upside there. You may make more money on that stuff than your current salary. And you're going to learn so much. And here's the most important thing. You're going to learn so much that you can bring back to your company. You're going to have more cred to your company. So you'll increase your value to your company. Now you're speaking to your CEO from the perspective of being a board member somewhere else. You're at a peer level. So yeah, I think like enough is enough. If you're not getting tapped from work, get on a couple outside boards and you diversify. Increase your value. What do you think, Hunter? I love the idea. Yeah, I do, David. Thanks so much. Good to see you, David. Susan, we do need to go. Chuck, yep. Phil, great to see you guys. Awesome job. Susan, thank you. Thank you. All right, happy holidays, everyone. Really appreciate your active engagement. And by the way, uh, HMG has, uh, is building out a, a CXO panel that'll connect you to early stage companies that are about to take off. They're looking for advisory board members, uh, go to market partners uh, in our accelerator. Uh, and we look, at, we look to launch a boardroom training program as well. So I think you're spot on there, Susan and David. All right, thanks guys. Hey, take Great care. Panel. All yeah. right, bye. Great. Hey, next up, we have Tim Sandler. Tim's a co-founder and CEO at Tessian. 
Tim, good to see you. Great to be here, Hunter. Thanks for having me. Hey, you have an interesting background uh, at Tessian, and your roots come out of uh, financial services, right? Yeah, that's right. So I started my career working in finance in London. And tell us uh, where you came across the idea of Tessian and uh, your journey, uh, including fundraising and where you are now. Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm an engineer by, by background. So I studied engineering at university uh, in London and I began my career working for one of the world's largest banks. So it's kind of an interesting pathway into starting, uh, founding a security company uh, in that um, I'd been around technology all my life and through my education. And then when I was working in banking, I was actually, I was on the banking side, facing up against uh, clients and dealing with customer data all the time. Um, and the problem that I saw working for one of the world's largest banks was that if you want to secure a network, you buy a firewall. And if you want to secure devices and endpoints, you buy an EDR platform. But what do you buy if you want to secure your people? And the answer then was, there is nothing you can buy. You have to rely on training them to do the right thing 100% of the time. Uh, so we thought there was an opportunity for a new innovation here. Uh, and we founded Tessian and we started building what we call the human layer security platform for the enterprise. So what we do at Tessian is we um, use machine learning to understand uh, normal and uh, anomalous patterns of behavior uh, with regard to how employees are using software and systems at work and handling data. We remediate threats in real time and then we provide them with contextual warnings to help them get more secure and more educated about how they uh, how they can be secure going forward. And we focus our time at the moment on email because this is where the majority of human uh, activated threats happen. Um, and uh, as you mentioned, we've, we've been fortunate to be backed by some of the best in the industry. We're backed by Excel, Sequoia. We've raised about $70 million to date. Congratulations. And uh, you've had some success in FS, right? We've had a lot of success in financial services. So we have many Fortune 500 customers in the financial services vertical. We work with mid-market customers too. I think about 90% of the independent investment banks. And I think that is just because the sensitivity of data that's being handled on email and the regulation that uh, exists around that data is, um, it's, it's just so, the consequences are so bad when you, when you get that wrong as an organization. So we help our customers uh, with challenges like preventing misdirected email communications containing sensitive data. Uh, we help prevent the wrong attachment being uploaded uh, to an email, uh, phishing, so on and so forth. So it's really resonated with, uh, with that industry. Um, but that's no surprise to me. That's exactly uh, where we thought there was, uh, there was a great opportunity for change in terms of securing the employee versus securing the, the machines that we often see. Yeah, you know, what is it really meant by securing the human layer? Dive down uh, into that a little deeper. Yeah, so I, I think about it as, and there are obviously lots of different technologies that touch um, the platforms that people spend their time in. But the challenge today is that ultimately, and I think someone was talking about this earlier, um, there's been this huge wave of digital transformation. Um, and it's been a, a really amazing thing. It's allowed employees to be able to move faster, do more with less, um, we no longer have to go to the bank to deposit money or transfer funds. We can do all of that electronically. But the challenge comes, there's sort of a hangover effect to that, which is that we are now, uh, we've placed all of our systems and data in control of our employees. Um, and every time somebody makes a decision about an interaction they're making in one of your systems or handling a piece of data, there's a propensity for human error there. So if I take, you know, Way back when, if all of my customer, all of my customers' uh, financial records would be maybe in filing cabinets, and it wouldn't be so easy to leak that data. But now they can be in spreadsheets. I can put the spreadsheet in an email. It's the wrong spreadsheet. I send it out. There's a breach right there. So we think of human layer security as the technology layer that is protecting those human digital interactions that take place. So every time somebody makes a decision about how you interact with a system, we want to be able to analyze that interaction and essentially say, does this look secure or not based on previous patterns of behavior? Um, so I, again, we focus on email today, but our plan is to expand to cover all kinds of interaction uh, that people make in the enterprise.
You know, Tim, when the uh, pandemic hit and we went to this work from home scenario and the threat landscape dramatically changed, what changed for you at Tessian and protecting your clients? Yeah, I mean, for us as a business, I think like every company around the world, we had to uh, adapt to a new way of working. And that meant, um, you know, how do you, how do you bring a team together that's distributed throughout the world? How do you get your systems online? How do you make sure they're secure? So on and so forth. And ultimately, we went, I think it was 24 hours, we had to figure out how we serve all of our customers globally. Um, and the good news is that we were pretty geared to work remote. You know, we're a relatively young company, sort of five years uh, old. So we've been planning for this from, from the beginning. Um, but I think really, you know, what we learned is that not all of our customers are able to be as agile as this. They have, you know, legacy infrastructure, they're dealing with a lot more change. Um, and the fundamental shift has been that uh, for the first time ever, visibility into how you are securing your people and what the risk posed by your employees and their security behavior is, is now more paramount than ever. It is super, super important. You have, uh, if you know, before you had your employees as the gatekeepers to your most sensitive systems and data, you now have those employees distributed throughout the world uh, and um, you know, distracted and under a lot of pressure in what has been a pretty tumultuous year. So we've seen a huge uptake in interest for the platform that we're, uh, we're building and we're selling to our customers. Um, and also we've seen um, the way in which we can secure them evolve as well. You know, Tim, an interesting title, turn your email data into your biggest defense. Uh, you wanna riff on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So I can't take credit for this, but um, we, <laughs> I think internally, something that was really interesting is how our customers, I think when you're building a company, which for me, like one of the most exciting things is hearing how your customers describe your own products back to you. Because you have kind of one, you have an idea of what you're building and how it's going to bring value. But this is something that came from a customer where they said, you know, what's really cool about what Tessian does is that we're essentially sitting on all of this data that already exists in the inboxes of every employee that we can leverage and we can gain insights from this data through machine learning algorithms and we can use that to better protect our organization and our people. And the example that came uh, to, the specific example for that tagline that you, you throw out there, Hunter, is um, we, we, we work with customers to prevent, you know, really advanced forms of BEC, phishing, impersonation attacks, external account takeover, so where the you know, the, the client of, the, uh, of, of one of our customers has maybe had their email account compromised. It's an email being sent from, a, from the legitimate account, but there's something that looks unusual about the request. Uh, we're leveraging the historical data that already exists in that customer's environment uh, to help defend them. Uh, so that's where the kind of leverage your, uh, your data to turn it into your biggest defense came from. Love it, love it. And, uh... What's next for you all and as you grow and uh, your, your influence and you grow your security uh, platform? Yeah, um, and again, we're lucky that it's been a great year for us. Um, and also, you know, we just, over the years, um, so again, when, when you're building a company, uh, I talk to our employees a lot about this. Um, without customers, you're just a concept. You know, if you have technology, but no customers using that technology, um, you, you can't necessarily call yourself a company. So we are really fortunate that our customers and the, the large customer base that we have now are the people that guide us in terms of what we should be doing next. So we have a really rich product roadmap for next year uh, that is addressing those other pertinent human layer security threats. Um, but what I'm excited to say without kind of revealing too much is that uh, one of the biggest shifts we'll be undertaking next year is we want to try and help security leaders and security teams um, better uh, measure and uh, use intelligence from human layer security risk scores uh, so that they can help improve their security posture. Um, and uh, this is something we'll be talking more about in Q1, so watch the space. But what's been great is that our customers have, have guided us here. They've helped us develop this product. Um, and uh, everything we do is just based on what their needs are, how we can help them. Uh, and uh, I think someone again said it on the panel before this, but it's a really great time to be in security. And I take a lot of, um, I take a lot of pride in how we can help 
customers or, or anybody uh, better defend their organization in what is a, a pretty tough year. Hey, Tim, how can people get in touch with you and the folks at Tessian? Yeah, so I mean, you can email me uh, at tim.sadler at tessian.com or add me on LinkedIn. Um, and I would love to chat to, to anyone who's interested. Um, otherwise, there's some great resources on our website, uh, tessian.com forward slash blog. Um, and uh, you can find some great content there as well. So um, if you want to contact me directly, feel free. Otherwise, if you want to read a bit more, uh, you can go to our website. And Tim, you do conferences or uh, digital broadcasts, right? Yeah, we do. We, we talk a lot. We try and put a lot of, I guess, value add thought leadership out there. And we also, um, we, we love doing these events with uh, HMG. So you can find us here and in the future as well. And we, we run something called the Human Layer Security Summit. Um, and it's an amazing event. We have, you know, over a thousand attendees at the last one. Um, and uh, that is essentially talking about and bringing forward this new practice of security to the enterprise and helping uh, security teams and leaders understand how they can uh, bring those practices into their organization. So check that out too. Yeah, folks, Tim Sadler, co-founder of Tessian, great thought leader, industry visionary. Tim, always good to see you, my friend. Take yeah, care. Very good to see you too. Thanks, Hunter. Talk Bye. to you soon. Next up, we have Rocco Grillo. Rocco is a managing director of global cyber risk services at Alvarez Marcel. Everyone loves and knows Rocco. Securing the future of work, my friend. Take it away. Thank you again for having me, Hunter, and the HMG team, as well as the attendees. Joined today by an all-star uh, lineup of uh, security executive experts. Um, before we jump in with some quick introductions, just want to lay the theme of um, our panel. As Hunter had mentioned, securing the future of uh, uh, remote work. Uh, to that end, you know, nobody could have had the crystal ball um, a year ago, 10 months ago, whatever the case may be. We've seen phishing spiking, business email compromises, all types of fraud, ransomware. We won't even get into that uh, at this point. Uh, third party service providers being compromised and lo and behold, the, the state of the nation state attacks just through the roof. Um, with that, I wanna hand off to our esteemed, esteemed uh, panelists. Start off with uh, Leka, if you could uh, just give us your background and some of your thoughts to secure in the future of work. Thanks, Rocco, and uh, good to meet the panel as well. We have exchanged some emails before. Uh, I'm Lika Banerjee. I'm a chief architect and futurist at one of the large uh, global uh, financial companies. And um, uh, especially with respect to this, um, to this topic, I have to state that I'm, I'm no a security expert. So unlike my fellow panelists, uh, it's not something that I live and breathe uh, you know, as part of my day job. However, I do believe that, you know, that the dual aspects of risk and security is something all of us as technologists have to, you know, inbuild into our DNA, regardless of where we are in the tech org. And, and so, you know, as a developer, as a tester, um, as an architect, as an infrastructure person, what have across the chain, uh, securing you know, everything that we do, we all deal with sensitive data is something uh, that, that is like ingrained in, in as, as part of, you know, I think the DNA. And uh, the reason I'm looking forward to this, uh, this panel discussion is especially because of the future aspect. The, uh, so we know, uh, we have had a glimpse into what can be the next 10 years with respect to what's happened in 2020, but there's a lot more coming, you know, not just with, uh, you know, with, with more IoT, with, um, you know, with driverless transportation devices, et cetera. And what is it, you know, I'm looking forward to the discussion in terms of what, what are some of the challenges that we expect uh, to, to, uh, to, to see and overcome as well. Great, thank you. Next up, my good friend, Partif Shah. Partif, thanks for joining us today. Sure. Hello, everyone. This is Partif Shah. Um, looking forward to this conversation. Um, I know many of you from my past lives as well. Um, you know, would love the conversation. Fantastic. Thanks, Partif. And it's it's old home week here for all my friends. N Nelly Norman, you're up next. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me, Rocco. Um, and in, I'm really looking uh, forward to doing the panel with the team. Uh, I have been with, uh, I've been in the industry for roughly 20 years. I've been with Moody's for five years. I lead threat and vulnerability management, and that also includes the cyber incident response. 
Uh, so as everyone is, you know, we talk about um, COVID uh, and how quickly uh, this pandemic forced us to go into the future work from home in a very expedited manner where we had to very quickly adapt. Now, some organizations might have been a bit more prepared if their um, organization and their team members had that model in place. But I think some of the organizations that did not have that setting uh, struggled a bit more to actually uh, be up and running. And most certainly, it's not just having your, 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 your infrastructure up and running to support a remote workforce. It's also ensuring that it's secure uh, and not only from technology, uh, technologies only, you also have to consider the training, uh, your people processes uh, and that shift. Uh, so we will provide additional more uh, details on this. And as you know, as quickly as um, everything else shifts, uh, the adversaries are also uh, right along with us uh, planning um, and are aware of our challenges and the opportunities uh, they actually have uh, in order for them to take advantage of the situation. No doubt. Great points, Nelly. And last but not least, uh, HMG fellow uh, alumni as well as board advisor and a good friend, Fred Harris, you're up. Hey, Rocco, good to see you. Uh, yeah, it's uh, Fred Harris. I'm the head of um, cybersecurity risk, data risk, and IT risk at uh, Societe Generale or SOCGEN, as most of you know it. It's a French bank. The Americas region uh, is my responsibility. So we were one of the firms that were fortunate that we had made the significant amount of control improvements. Uh, and so we were prepared um, for the, the crisis. We went to a 98% work from home um, environment in, in a little under a week. Uh, really the only thing we needed to do was add excess capacity to our VPN. So we were extremely fortunate. Um, and, and so I'm happy to walk through some of the improvements we made as we go through the conversation. And then some of the things I'm thinking about is this hybrid approach where you're really going to see more people working from home on a more frequent basis. So, you know, estimates are to two, three days in the office or in a near, nearer office than, than exists today. And then how do we manage that going forward, that particular dynamic from a security perspective? Great. Thanks, Fred, and to everyone on the panel. Um, you know, I've been fortunate to do these with um, the HMG team over the past couple, two, three years, including going to the virtual ones starting as recent as April. And with that, you know, similar topics, but almost feel like COVID fatigue and what we want to get out of this or deliver today is not so much um, what have we done in response, but build off of that and what's the future look like. And I'm preparing for this with uh, the panelists. We looked at the different kinds of technologies, um, the different types of things that companies are doing. Even um, a couple of months ago, I worked with Gary Sorrentino, deputy CIO over at Zoom, and we did um, something in terms of what the future of work looks like. And if you see some of the things that Zoom is doing, including this um, presentation itself, as well as what um, um, what uh, Harry mentioned before, Harry mentioned before during the Thanksgiving uh, break. There, there's different technologies that companies haven't jumped on to being able to work remote or transforming um, their their enterprises. They need to jump on the digital transformation bandwagon fast or be left behind. Um, so to that end, Emily, I knew one of the points you threw out there is um, how do we move forward from full time which we, um, in a corporate environment, to hybrid, which I think is current state, but now moving forward with you know, distributed environments, the different types of technologies our employees are using. Um, you know, the, the term you had thrown out to me was uh, digital distancing. How do we take this on? Would our employees feel like they, they can do their work, but at the same time, while we try to maintain the security, not only around our environment, but our employees' actions, how do we move forward without them feeling like big brothers watching, but at the same time balance it with the environment being secure? I think we Rocco, have was, was that for me? Yes. Right, yeah. And I think you know. I mean, it it is the uh, it it is it's always been the conundrum as uh, security teams when we think about you know even even before the term digital distancing became cool, 
we 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 i think we were always evolving towards having a distributed workforce with you know global outsourcing and you have a constant flow for large companies uh of you know a mix of you know full time and contract workers and and you know consulting companies and uh, i think over a, you know over the years I mean, even if i see the evolution over the last 20 odd years there have been a lot of like stricter controls you know more frequent uh, you know access reviews um, you know um, you know trying to like instead of getting access uh, i mean large companies we still have mainframes in in instead of getting access to the entire mainframe you know try to you know modularize that and you know bring it down uh, where the, where wherein you have access to a very specific point but you know all of these are not going to be like you know enough anymore and with us talking about the future of work you know unfortunately i think we do have to you know uh, move towards a, a more of a zero trust uh, uh, situation regardless of where you are in the tier uh, and zero trust comes in a, in a couple of ways not just with respect to the specific a specific human being but also all of the devices that they are using and what it then means is you know instead of like the standard you know two factor authentication it does need to move in, move into a more dynamic level uh, um of authorized authentication and authorization that happens because we do know even as of now even in 2020 with you know change in workforce and optimization you know workforce optimizations and you know uh, disgruntled employees or contractors there are there is active selling of credentials in the dark web or you know whatever uh, you know what whatever uh, bad actors out there and so but this is because i mean even now the the whole policy of authentication authorization and audit is still very static in nature and it does need to move into being more dynamic yes biometrics is a big part of that but even then there have to be these other factors that come into when we it has to be truly multi factor where the other dimensions of the uh, uh, multi-factor uh, uh, authorization has to be dynamic, wherein even if I sell my credentials, it's of no use because there are so many other components fusing into what we're doing. I think this, so, so that, that's that aspect of uh, zero trust. The second aspect of Big Brother, again, is something we can't shy away from because again, you not only have bad actors inside uh, the firm in, in all these different ways that we talked about, you do have, you know, state-sponsored uh, bad actors as well, and in which case, you know, every single, you know, uh, sen what we would call a sensitive access needs to be actually tracked. And it's not that even me, as you know, as a CXO, if I have access to production data and I have a valid situ you know, situation to go and check that, it has to still be dynamically authorized. Not to say that I'm getting to a queue, right? Not to say that we are adding red tape to it, but you do need to have a certain level of uh, dynamicity involved, even for authorized users as to why am I looking at this particular trust fund? What am I trying to research? And then that has to then flow to the rest of the organization. So as we evolve, I, uh, I mean, at least my view is we do need to, uh, we, we need to do this in a much more granular level and widespread. Great, thank you for that. And you know, we, we talk about all the technology that's out there. We talk about the employee, the awareness, the fishing, the Achilles, you know, employees being the Achilles heel. Um, we need to train them. We need to do this. We need to do that. But um, I think uh, Wall Street Journal ran an interesting section yesterday on cybersecurity and training um, for the employee that we can't do this by fear. We can't keep telling the employee, um, if you click on that link, you're going to take down the whole company. If you don't have a strong password, you're going to take down the company. The interest in article, if you didn't see it, it's it's posted. You should take a look at it and say this to all of our attendees. But with that, you know, Partiv, I know when we were we were talking about the different things that companies have done from controls um, to you know in response to COVID. What are some of the things that companies have done in response to COVID? And at the same time, what are some of the things that um, companies are preparing to do differently as we go into the future. Sure, thank you. Um, Virako, before I answer that question, I was listening to what Lekha was mentioning, and you also mentioned New York Times. So you guys recently read an article that talked about how um, FireEye, unfortunately, one of the most forensics firm who was recently um, exposed by nation state, to your point there, I think 
right now we are in fun times, guys. Why? Because <laughs> adversary has same amount, if not more time than you do sitting at their desk. They are doing 24 seven jobs, putting extended hours and they are trying to get in. I'm not trying to again, uh, scare people here. That's not my goal here. But the goal is what I'm trying to demonstrate that says conventional thinking. Again, I, I work in a bank, just using that as an example, that any financial institution that, that are out there where these financial institutions where conventionally had a, had a, had a you know, front staff office admins, they had, a, um, they had um, tellers and, 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 and all of the different, different staff that was out there pre-COVID. COVID hits you. Now, were these companies prepared? Can they provide remote access to 100% of the employees and can and adequately provide that control? That conventional thinking, yeah, I will block stuff for printing. You know, I'm on many mailing lists, as you guys can imagine. And I see funny emails where I, I chuckle when I read that says, yeah, we have a tight environment from data leakage, but by the way, we allow printers at home because of the COVID-19 reasons, we deployed people to have printers. Well, you just defeated the purpose of having that control by providing that, that printing capability at home. So idea here is as we are that social distancing or digital distancing, um, I like that term by the way. So as, as we are applying there, um, we wanna be able to identify what additional controls are needed now that you are um, perhaps we at digital distance models because your conventional thinking you are in four walls everyone knows there are cameras on the top people are watching you but now you and your wife might be working for I uh, maybe in opposite companies potentially so now if someone can see your data that's possible all these different permutations as you think through are possible so as you are protecting information or at work make sure your companies are thinking, when I speak with my board, you know, uh, same example, when I talk to them, where are we secure? And answering that particular question, are we secure? Now I have to take that and, and take into the, all these different leakages and models into consideration when I'm answering this. So my advice to all of you folks, think through and, when, and, and look at from your angle, uh, if someone comes to you, are you secure? What does that mean in this new COVID-19 world? And people, paper data, physical data, logical data, people talk about cloud, again, all over the place, these things, technology components we talk about, you know, again, ask yourself, are you secure? Nobody ever asks that question, Parthiv. Does the board really ask that? No, that's a bad joke, but uh, anyway. Um, I'm on points. multiple boards in my past lives, and then my current role, my past CISO role, and previous oh, but... CISO role, and so when, when and these and, and these multiple roles, I get an interesting questions on my, you know, because some tech savvy individual on the board may say, you know, you know, what do you think of the mainframe versus they are now legacy practical technology? They may ask versus some board members who are who are more business operational mind, and they just they just want to know simple, can the CISO tell me in, to, in, in next three minutes, are we secure? And now I have to dance in front of them demonstrating, yes, because of this metrics, because of this resiliency reasons, and because of A, B, and C, third party validation mechanisms, I believe you can say we are secure. You know? So that's a interesting uh, model there. Good stuff. Thank you, Parteev, and keeping an eye on time. Nelly, I know there's a wealth of information that you could bring to the table for us. Um, and looking forward with the proverbial future um, secure, um, hybrid work or even the remote worker of the future. What, uh, what else can we be doing as we move into the next stage of not even the pandemic, but post pandemic as we go to the hybrid or even permanent remote world? Uh, absolutely. Um, I think when Prathib mentioned the fire eye breach, that was huge. And it actually confirms the um, you know, it's, it's sometimes a matter of time and how prepared are you, regardless of your setting, whether you're remote in office. Now, the challenge this brings to us from a working remote and how to secure it, what to improve is really look at your, the attack surface, right? Uh, and also the different challenges and risks that we face because of that shift. So in order from a preparedness act aspect and, and key factors to ensure that your remote workforce is is operating well, consider cyber hygiene. And it's not just your office setting environment because that changed. It includes you know, your, your home Wi-Fi networks that your employees are working uh, from. They do not have the same security controls that you have in the office networks. Um, and also in addition to this, if you, um, from a training awareness cyber hygiene, we have to be able to educate our employees and team members to ensure that they think 
about security, not just in the office. There's a shift. We have to have them think about what they're doing at home, how they're securing their home networks, their mobile devices. And as you also know, as corporations improve, we improve our email detections to block uh, malware and, and, and malicious URLs, et cetera, the actors are shifting to mobile platform text messages. I, I personally have seen a, a big increase in how many text messages I get that are just very strange. Now, a day-to-day -day person or your employee that's not in tech may not understand why they're getting this and they're just gonna click on it, especially if they're expecting a package. So training and awareness also, when you look at it the traditional way, you know, you do, you do the training where you're sending um, fish, you know, like phishing tests to, to across your whole organization. You really need to think about this from a uh, job specific uh, phishing exercises where you're actually doing targeted because the actors actually, they do reconnaissance, they do their homework. They find out quite a bit about the person or the target before they actually craft and launch an attack. The other piece is when it comes from a cyber incident response aspect uh, and also from a vulnerability management, your capability and ability to actually be able to scan and patch um, you, you know, the environment that you have that now you don't have everybody on that network in the office, uh, people could VPN in, you know, that, that, that set up to do that, you, you have to be prepared also to be able to scan and patch. Now, at least um, that when it comes to response, uh, uh, from a response standpoint, you know, having an endpoint solution that allows you to contain, right? That's very important remotely. In addition to this, when we look at IR from an incident responses, um, you know, if, if preparing your executive leadership, your teams to actually function in crisis when an incident does occur. There is no time to be able to figure out, well, what do I do now? What am I looking at? You have to have your teams trained regularly to handle cyber incidents that pretty much could become crisis. So that way you're prepared. And the one piece that sometimes, you know, it's overlooked, having a retainer in place to bring on outside help instead of having to deal with, uh, let me, uh, you know, call uh, Rocco <laughs> or, or a different um, organization. It was in a commercial. We need, uh, you know, cyber help, you know, cyber incident response help. And it, it takes a while to put all these in place. So from a preparedness aspect, the way um, I, I believe every company should function is be prepared uh, to actually handle an incident, not only from a technical level, but have your leadership trained on what occurs, what steps do they need to take, who makes what decision, when you do have a, an incident that becomes uh, public, like FireEye, you just experienced, and many other organizations. Great. Fantastic, Nelly, some great points. And I know um, I see Hunter popping up there, but uh, Fred, um, you and I talked about a wealth of different things, and I want to see if you can wrap up a few things for us from um, you know, the exposures around um, uh, deep fake audio, yep. um, people using IoT devices, and even further as we continue this evolution into the, the future of the remote worker, 5G and other technologies. If you can expand on those without Hunter yeah. getting excited on us. Um, I will, I will try to do it in two minutes. So we, uh, if you think about the, the advancement in deep fake audio with AI and machine learning, people now will have the ability to execute vision campaigns, which is voice phishing, in, in, at the speed of machine. So they will learn how to be successful and they will succeed. So you need to bring in technologies to allow you to identify or to eliminate known bad numbers, known bad actors, right? There are companies out there like <clears throat> Secure Logics that can assist with that, right? Um, working from home, how, and, and you know, we talked a little bit about it, but uh, making sure that you're deactivating your active listening devices. So your two-way conversations over speakerphone are not getting recorded at Google and Apple and Amazon, right? It's, it's, it, it, and, and they're discoverable, um, although they fought some of the legislation, right? But they're there for, for eventual discovery, right? And then I think as you think about 5G and our security designs, they're predominantly perimeter-based. Right, we we have our physical and logical perimeter, and we have paths in and out of our perimeter. <clears throat> now we're talking about eliminating that physical, 
perimeter with a software defined infrastructure and how do we change as an industry to handle that when you no longer need to go through a defined pipe or be sitting in a physical location to have full access to a network. So those are some of the problems that we're thinking about and that we're discussing. Fantastic. Thanks, Fred. Hunter, over to you. Hey, Rocco, great job. Thanks, uh, Nelly and Lekka and uh, Fred and Partiv. Awesome job all. Really, really appreciate it. Final comment, each of you, best time ever, most exciting time ever in your career, Nelly, to be in this space. Um, I, I personally love responding to incidents. <laughs> I think there's a lot of a lot of energy. Uh, it's very stressful. So you really have to be able to uh, lead a technical team and at the same time be able to manage uh, senior management. Uh, you know, so it, I think uh, just really to be in this field is is incredibly um, amazing during this time. It evolves quickly, and you have to stay up. Uh, to speed with everything that uh, else that's going on within the industry. So. Yeah, and, and to add in that in financial services, if you have the benefit of being in a position where your IT and security posture is in in a favor looked at in a favorable light by the regulators, mm -hmm. and you're allowed to concentrate on offense and future, it's an exciting place to be. Excellent. Hey guys, thanks so much. Have a great uh, weekend and uh, enjoy your holiday season. Really appreciate your active engagement. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Thanks again for joining. Yep. Awesome. Hey, next up, we have Alan Toledo. You, won't, you will not want to miss this one. Uh, Alan's the field CTO of Redis Labs, a really interesting company. Digital first, learning from the pandemic to succeed. Hey, Alan, good to see you. Hey, pleasure to be back. Hey, Alan. Give a little context of Redis Labs, who you are, what you're doing, and why, uh, why in the financial services space does it matter? Yeah, absolutely. So Redis Labs is what we call the home of Redis. And Redis is a NoSQL. It's a memory multi-model database. So DB Engines has this ranked as number seven most popular in across the entire industry. So think of IBM DB2, think of Oracle, Redis is right there. So for US technology leaders, why that's relevant is because Redis is probably already in your enterprise. So we're either talking about the open source version or our enterprise version for your mission critical systems. So the enterprise version that provides you with the securest version of Redis out there. It also gives you that business continuity. So a lot of you financial services companies, you have those regulators that are forcing you to have multiple geolocations for not only disaster recovery, but being able to withstand an entire data center loss and not having a hiccup. So having that active active technology at the database level is extremely important. We're also providing best in class performance. So we're talking about sub millisecond performance at digital scale. So hundreds of thousands, millions of operations per second. Think mainframes, they just weren't built to do that. And if you can get them to do it, think about the cost associated to that. So, you know, Pat from Remini, she, she talked about the cost and how they kind of anchor certain uh, organizations. There's some estimates out there that some organizations, 60 to 70% of their operational expenditure, they go towards a legacy stack, legacy anchoring technology that doesn't let you get to the cloud, which means you're not able to start deploying those digital applications. Now add to that the increasing risk of cybersecurity, which will only go up with digital, add to that regulations increasing. What you have is a very small margin for innovation. And if you don't innovate, and if you don't get to digital, you're gonna be in that hard, you know, you're gonna face a pandemic and you're gonna be in that hard decision space, which we'll talk about coming up. Um, in addition to that, we provide a cloud native service. So we were crazy enough nine years ago to create a database as a service company. And at this point, we're able to transition into managed services, partnerships with Microsoft Azure, with GCP. We even have a uh, partnership with AWS. Um, so you have that first class managed service on the cloud. But you, you could deploy our software as hybrid between the cloud, use that active act technology for on-prem or deploy on-prem on your PaaS. So think about OpenShift or PCF or just Kubernetes or even on just VMs and bare metal. Basically future-proofing your enterprise roadmap, no matter where you are in your kind of digital transformation or cloud journey, you don't have to worry about where you are to where you're going to be or even the next three to five years because we're going to be there for you. So super exciting time uh, for Redis Labs. We continue to grow. We just recently had our Series F funding. So we got to that unicorn status, that over a billion valuation. And we're going to continue to invest that back into the open source community. We're going to invest that back into our products and services, continue to grow our customer base. So really exciting time to be at Redis Labs.
Very, very cool. You know, Alan, when you think of Redis Labs, you work across uh, many industries and many large enterprises. Yeah. What are your customers, what do you see with your customers and uh, uh, specifically in FS? Yeah, yeah, we'll focus just here. You know, we, we really cross the spectrum of every industry and the major brands, but we'll focus here on the financial services. And I think it's, it provides this, uh, you know, broad perspective that will be interesting to the audience here. Uh, we work across the entire financial services sector. So different industries, we're talking about uh, the largest and even some of the smallest uh, fintechs, the neo banks, the challenger banks. You know, I think uh, Satish uh, from Allied Bank uh, gave a great presentation earlier. That's, you know, a challenger bank, no uh, digital footprint. We also work with the largest banking institutions, kind of traditional ones. So, you know, out of the top 15 U.S. banks, half of them are actually our customers. Um, all the credit card payment processing companies, credit unions, uh, regional banks, you know, we really kind of run the gamut. And, you know, that provides this broad view of kind of how different industries and obviously different levels of companies within those industries reacted to the pandemic. And to kind of simplify it down for us here for this, you know, sake of time, you can kind of bucket things into three tiers. That's the way I look at it. And you can, you know, segment kind of the digital transformation journey or maybe your digital uh, data strategy kind of execution. And you can segment that into three tiers. So the ones that are furthest along, you think about neobanks and challenger banks, right, and fintechs because they don't have that physical footprint, which means they have already established digital channels and already established digital consumers um, of those channels. So for them, the pandemic created a situation where there was just an influx of demand and they just needed to invest properly to meet that demand. So kind of a rhetorical decision. You go to the other end of that spectrum, you got your you know, local community banks, you have your lower end kind of regional banks, maybe some uh, credit unions, they had those lower margins we talked about just earlier, right? They weren't able to make those digital investments or maybe their consumers didn't care as much about digital. And for them, the pandemic created a different situation. They might've still been able to, you know, uh, service their local, you know, their local businesses, but they weren't able from like an opportunity perspective, take advantage of everyone kind of jumping to these digital channels. So the middle tier, that's probably the most interesting. We're talking about, you know, the larger financial institutions that already had digital presence and we're further along the digital transformation and more regional banks that were kind of further along. Uh, and we see those that middle tier really into having to make a decision. Are we going to take it? Are we going to invest here and get the opportunity or kind of hunker down? And, you know, real world kind of using an example here to simplify it. You think about the PPP program and what happened there. The organizations that were able to leverage that at scale the most, they were the same ones that had the digital uh, presence and the digital kind of architecture, they were digitally transformed to be able to make that pivot very quickly because they had to you know, build in the, the compliance uh, and, and risk logic into that new service. They had to create that portal or integrate it with an existing uh, way to, to consume from that digital channel and do that within a very short amount of time. And, the, and the, our customers, a lot of them were our customers, the types of institutions that took advantage of that they were the ones that won in this. Um, so even if it wasn't about profit, you kind of hear sometimes PPP with you know, low profits. Uh, the president and CEO of BNB, he, I think he said it best. He said the PPP program was the, the best marketing program you can ever have because we were able to connect with new consumers, maybe upsell our services, and those will stay on with us beyond the pandemic. So a big win for those kinds of organizations that made that digital pivot. Interesting. You know, when you think about digital transformation being kicked into high gear and, uh, different kinds of architectures, cloud architecture specifically, um, what do you see there and how did Redis Labs help uh, companies go to the cloud? Yeah, so we were just really, really well positioned because we were, like I said, born on the cloud and, and our model for how we, you know, uh, how our consumers, how our customers consume our technology was already a great fit for, for the cloud and also what happened here during the pandemic. And I think the best way to look at that and, you know, the general theme here is about business agility is to break it down into three pillars, again, for the sake of argument here, for the sake of time. So the first pillar is something that we've seen probably over the last 10 years already of a migration to a subscription uh, licensing model. So you think about 10 years back, everything was perpetual. You were buying you know, technology, you were trying to amortize that over a certain amount of years and try to generate that you know, ROI over multiple years. That doesn't fit really well when the pandemic strikes and you have to adjust, maybe scale up, scale down really, really quickly. So having that subscription model, and we've seen that with our customer base where you know, the neobanks and the fintechs, well, they were able to scale up really quick. Some of those regional banks, they had to maybe scale down or renegotiate that term. By having that flexibility it gives you the business agility to make quick decisions uh, with, aligned with your vendors. So, um, and that's moving, as we move into the cloud, that actually transitions into more of a consumption model, you know, with our managed service as well. 
So the next two pillars, they're oriented around the cloud. So when you think about the procurement model, right? You've all been there. We think about it almost like a two month span. And in that two months, what do we go through? We go through vendor risk management assessments. We go through security assessments, you know, con contractual negotiation, price negotiation. All of that is a cost center. All of that is a lot of effort and time, which has no ROI. Now, if you're trying to pivot within a month, you know, in the pandemic, that two months is going to cost you. In the new model, right, the marketplace model that's built on top of these cloud providers, you can basically avoid all of that because you have pre-negotiated contracts. You already have the assurances from these cloud providers that they invested into the compliance and security of their platforms. And these services that are built on top of them are taking advantage of all of that. You already have pre-negotiated pricing. So for you to be able to consume a service like Redis Labs, it's a matter of a click of a button, as long as that partnership and that managed service is there and accredited by that cloud provider. So a real game changer in order to, uh, in terms of consuming technology. And with that is that third pillar. If you have that partnership with the cloud provider, then you have that integrated billing. And now for you as a CIO, and I'm sure a lot of you have these negotiations with the large cloud providers, think about Azure or GCP, you have those big cloud commits, which you already pre-negotiated discounts with. So now if you wanted to consume a technology like ours, a specialized technology, you don't want to get locked into the cloud, you can do so and leverage your existing commit, that budget that you already pre-negotiated towards new technology. So now we're talking about just a click of a button and you're up and going. You don't got to go find new budget and deal with that process. It's all about business agility. So those three pillars, when they come together in terms of how we consume technology, it's a game changer for business agility. And I think getting out of this pandemic the kind of muscle memory that's uh, that was built from this is going to continue on. It's really going to be the new paradigm for how uh, technology is consumed. And those that are not acclimated to that, they're really going to be left behind. Yo, know, Alan, great, great points. What uh, leadership style uh, adjustments did you make during the pandemic? Yeah, absolutely. So, well, you know, it, it, there's kind of two flavors, right? The internal leadership and terms of external leadership. So for me, leadership, it's, it's all about, you know, empathy and empowerment. And then you can kind of you could uh, add in vision. So from an empathy and empowerment point of view, you know, a lot of times uh, leaders, we talk about that, right? I think the pandemic, the, what it did is, is shine a light on leaders about, can we really do it? Can we actually live it? Because now that we go into a more remote model, it's all about empowerment. We can't be watching, uh, you know, our employees entire time. So you have to build them up. You have to give them the space. You want to hire, you know, in Redis Labs, we, we have the kind of culture already that was built in. So for us, it was an easier transition once we all started working from home about, hey, we hire great people and then we're going to let them do what they do best and we're going to trust them. So having that trust, it, it really kind of goes forward in terms of empowerment. And that empathy, it really got uh, emphasized so much more than even, you know, in the regular day when we're in the office, because you know, when you give somebody a workload and, and, and you know they're going to come through with it, you have to anticipate that there's, you know, maybe two, three kids like pulling on their shirt in the middle of this meeting. You know, um, you never know what the person has on the other side that maybe in the office they were able to detach from. But now with the pandemic and everything that's going on, you never know what they have in the background. So having that empathy uh, was really kind of uh, uh, emphasized. And I think the leaders that really show that are, are really going to be the leaders that come out of this are the strongest and have the strongest culture in their organization. And then having that vision and that kind of connects to being um, from an external point of view, because understanding what your customers, customers are going through and being able to shine that vision, show that vision to your organization so that everyone's on the same path. Everyone understands what we're trying to achieve, not only for ourselves as an organization, but for our customers. That's what people buy into. That's why they're going to, you know, work that, that extra mile, uh, deal with the kids nagging at them, uh, you know, deal with the online learning, but still get the job done and be happy and enthusiastic like I am here to do it. So hey, Alan, um, great, great job, Alan. How can people uh, get connected to you at Redis and others? Yeah, absolutely. So I think we're going to share uh, a link to, it's going to be really interesting for you. It's a, it's a magazine that we actually came out with at the C, for the CIOs out there. Uh, we have, you know, like an article about, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Scott McNeely from uh, Sun Microsystems for 20 years interviews and interviews with a lot of leaders and conversations that you're interested in. A lot of the ones we talked about today. So we'll share that with you. You can check us out on redislabs.com. Feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn, Alan Turletto. Uh, I'd love to get in touch with you. And, uh, you know, I hope this was, a, hope this was fun. Excellent. Great job, Alan. Appreciate you coming in. Thanks for your support. Talk to All you right. soon. Thanks, Hunter. Yep. Hey, next up, we have the Innovation Accelerator, an inside look at cool new tech. First up is Nikhil Gupta. Nikhil is the co-founder and CEO of Armor Code. Hey, a couple of things. Uh, the space you're in, the problem the and the opportunity, and uh, the stage you're in. Excellent. Excellent. So, you know, as <clears throat> the, the 
previous panelists mentioned that you know software is eating the world everything is going digital and uh, so you know there has to be better and faster way of securing your applications if you will so, you know 20 plus years ago when i was at bell labs we used to have one release a year and you will have like a nine months release and three months people will do security testing but now we have like nine release in nine months so how do you secure at that pace of development now you have a whole bunch of tools you have a sas DAS. Rasp, like whole plot of tools, but these are all siloed tools which don't talk to each other. And still, despite having the, all these good tools, you still need to spend a lot of time uh, manually in you know building it Excel sheets and doing the workflow. So primarily, like uh, we are chartered out here to you know solve or simplify the application security. Uh, at the stage where we are in, uh, you know we are one of the uh, COVID bond companies, if you will. We are started like six months ago, uh, right in the midst of a pandemic, because we saw that the need is going to grow. Being a serial entrepreneur, I couldn't control and see this as an opportunity here. Uh, we have several uh, big POCs going on and super excited to be in this space. Great. Thanks, Akhil. Stay with us. We'll circle back to you in just a minute. Next up is Brendan Hannigan. Uh, he's the CEO and co-founder of Sunray Security. Brendan, great to see you. Hey, Hunter. Very nice. Thank you for uh, having us here. Awesome. Uh, so we, my uh, company, Sunray Security, uh, we're actually based out in New York. We have multiple large financial services clients. And as, as you and many people here are focused on moving to the cloud, it's not untypical for you, I'm sure, to have hundreds of cloud accounts, 50 to 100 DevOps teams, tens of thousands of pieces of compute, uh, thousands of roles and a dizzying array of complexity under the hood in these cloud accounts. And under the hood, this kind of identity and access complexity can lead to a lot of risk in your clouds. And so our company has a service. Um, it's an identity and data governance service for companies using AWS, Azure, Google, and, and actually Kubernetes type environments. And we de-risk these environments by finding these holes, automatically eliminating them, and making sure that they never come back again. So just to give you a, a few examples of, of what it is we can do. So uh, if you think of identity risk, so we've won a large financial services company with about 40,000 employees. And despite all of the internal controls, which you would expect from a financial services uh, company, we uncovered hundreds of identity risks and we can automatically get them to what we would call least privilege in these environments without the need for manual review. Another company, there's two, two things in this risk. One is identity and the other side is the resource, the data that, there's, that uh, is being accessed. We have a top 10 uh, financial bank in the United States and hundreds of production AWS and Azure data stores are continuously baselined and monitored for access. If something changes, so for example, somebody has a serverless function which suddenly gets access to that database, our service can trigger response. And then finally, Hunter and team, and we've heard a lot about it today. Velocity is just at the cornerstone of digital disruption. And we have to change how it is we manage security in these environments. And so we actually have uh, a, another uh, financial institution, top 10 North America bank, and they have incredible controls, but it was taking them two weeks, two weeks, to onboard a new application into public cloud based on these controls. And through automated analytics, we were able to get it down to under 24 hours of elapsed time. So we're a, we're a, a series B company. We've raised $38 million and we've many production companies. We would, as you would expect Hunter, uh, we're innovators, but there's a bar you have to reach. So we've reached that with SOC 2 compliance and all the third party risk, et cetera, that you would have to go to, to get into production with financials. Excellent stuff, Brendan. Who did you raise your B round from? Uh, it was led by Menlo Ventures, who's somebody who I has invested in a few of my other companies before. And uh, we also have continued support by Polaris Ventures and 1011 Ventures out of California. How did you possibly come up with the idea? You know what, it's actually, it's a great question. And uh, I was previously chairman of a company called Twistlock and the idea is born at the 50,000 foot level actually, this following realization which is, you know, I started out as a software engineer hunter and uh, building uh, switches and routers. And I built another company called Q1 Labs. The way we build software today has changed from stem to stern, every possible way. And my realization is as follows. 
is that because of that, we must reimagine how it is we govern and risk these environments. And there's three new control points which are critical for governance and risk in this digital disruption, digi digitally disrupted world. In the old days, it was firewalls and endpoints and things like that. In the new world, it's identities, data, and workloads. Those are the three control points our customers have to care deeply about. That's why we started the company. Excellent, Brendan. Stay with us. We'll circle back to you in just a minute. Uh, next up, we have Sarath Narayanan. Hey, Andrew. Uh, my, my last name is always as complex as you can imagine. So, Sharath is good. Thank you. Did I get Narayana? Yana. <laughs> Close. Yana. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and co founder and CRO of Observe AI. Uh, Hunter, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, again, um, I'm one of the founders of Observe AI. Uh, what we've essentially done is we fall into this whole gamut of contact center AI, which is probably the new buzzword of 2020. Uh, we've essentially built an AI platform. It's essentially an agent engagement and an agent enablement uh, platform. Uh, and we primarily work with large enterprise call centers. Uh, essentially for most of these call centers today, uh, they have millions of conversations uh, they don't get to audit every single conversation. They don't get to analyze every single conversation. We essentially use the power of cloud. We use the power of AI to essentially give 100% visibility to every enterprise on what their customers are texting, what their customers are emailing, what their customers are chatting, what their customers are telling them on uh, the customer conversations, customer support conversations as well. So that's essentially what we've built as a product. It's a three and a half year old startup. Uh, we started in early 2018. Um, uh, three founders, we've raised about $88 million in capital. Our latest round was uh, in this August, uh, a $55 million Series B round led by Menlo Ventures. Uh, in this pandemic and in this digital transformation, cloud migration, AI transformation, all happening in the same year, uh, we've been benefactors of all this transition happening around. Uh, we've grown 600% uh, this year. Uh, we've grown our employee headcount by 300% in the same year as well. So it's it's been chaotic, uh, but we've gotten some method to this madness and we've kind of supported and grown really well. Congratulations. What an amazing uh, success. What do you attribute it to? I think uh, a lot of us to uh, some great people we've gotten on board. I, I must admit we were extremely lucky. I think when we, I, I don't think you can time to start an AI company better than at these times. Uh, we never knew the pandemic would happen. Uh, we never knew uh, all, like out of the blue, we would have large 5,000 seat contacts and just calling us to go live in a two week timeline. So we were honestly very lucky, uh, but I think we got on board a very, very good team. So I think the team came from a background uh, of contact centers and AI. Uh, and, and I think uh, everybody is uh, working very, very hard and, and we are like insanely lucky to be in this market at this time. Very, very cool. Uh, stay with us, Sharak. We'll get back to you in one minute. Next up is Balaji Parimi, uh, founder and CEO of CloudNox Security. Balaji, great to see you. So a little uh, context of your company and uh, your space and uh, the issues you're addressing and where you are in your funding. Yeah, um, Tarak, my background is I was an early employee of VMware. I built a lot of the, I mean, this was almost 15 years ago when VMware was a still small company and all that. Uh, I built a lot of the uh, cloud infrastructure systems as a, as a tech lead at VMware. And after that, I was at a SaaS company running uh, um, hybrid cloud using both VMware and AWS. And a lot of the problems that I was trying to solve there was the motivation behind starting this company. Um, so basically today, the cloud infrastructure, whether it is on-prem based on VMware or any of the public clouds, there is tremendous level of automation. All it takes is a one-liner to do pretty much anything. To Brennan's point, there are three key things that are identity, resource, and uh, data. Those are the key. And it's, I mean, the, the problems are abundant. So we look at identity, resource, actions. So basically all these actors that are operating in this environment need permissions in order to operate in this environment. And with one-liner having the ability to cause massive destruction to the company, either through data leakage or a service disruption or service degradation, it becomes imperative to make sure that these permissions are managed across these three dimensions in an automated fashion. So we built a cloud infrastructure entitlement management platform or a cloud permissions management platform from ground up 
I've seen this problem early on, started the company in 2017, even though I was working on it in 2016 solo, got several patents on it. We invented a, an activity-based authorization protocol that gives the ability for our customers to manage permissions of any type of identity, any type of resource, or from an action perspective as well, in an automated fashion across any cloud infrastructure, whether it is on-prem VMware or any of the public clouds. So we have several Fortune 100 customers that deployed us in production. We've been in business for a little over um, three years, and uh, we raised $30 million with uh, ClearSky Security Fund as, uh, as, as our main investor, and Sorensen Capital, Dell Technologies Capital, and uh, Foundation Capital as well. So we have both big contacts as strategic uh, partners as well. So what, what, what type of company and industry do you fit best? And, and, and what kind of, again, um, software issue in the infrastructure stack are you addressing? Um, so basically every organization that is running this cloud infrastructure needs to get the visibility across the three dimensions of how many identities are in there? What are they entitled to do? What are they actually doing? What is the gap in terms of what are they provisioned with and what are they actually using? How do I eliminate that gap to mitigate the risk? And how do I continuously monitor to make sure that the gap doesn't creep up again? And every enterprise that is using any cloud infrastructure or a combination, whether it is private cloud based on VMware or any of the public clouds would be a target customer for us. Awesome, great job, love it. Um, you back up to Nikhil. Nikhil, um, what is the ideal prospect look like that you want to meet? So, uh, you know, we have a pretty broad spectrum because every company is writing software at the end of the day. But what we are looking at as ideal target customers is anywhere from, you know, 100 million to, you know, $50 billion companies. We have been talking to Fortune 10, Fortune 50, Global 5000. We're at various different stages with all those companies. But any company who has an application security team or a product security team will be an ideal customer. The big challenge that we see, Hunter, here is that if you go to any uh, leader, whether CIO or CISO, and ask them a simple question, how many application and microservices do you have, let alone their security posture, you know, nobody has any clue. You will hear pin drop silence. And that's the problem we are addressing. And we believe that uh, pretty much any and every company uh, where they do not have a good handle, which we are seeing as a 99% of the cases, will be a good customer for us. And when you think of your challenges in going to market uh, in this pandemic environment, uh, um, how do you plan to really execute in this difficult, challenging market, getting new customers? So that's a very good question, uh, Hunter. And so because we started in the pandemic, so we had a lot of thought about that right before jumping in right in here. And, you know, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've been there several times. I understand the challenges and everything else. So did a, my homework well, spoke to a lot of com, uh, customers, potential customers to ensure that the problem persists. And, uh, you know, in a span of less than six months, we have already gotten these large customers. As Brendan mentioned about SOC2, we are already working on SOC2 because, you know, all global 5,000, Fortune 500, ask for that. So we know kind of, you know, the playbook is there, Hunter. So kind of repeating it and then, you know, partners like HMG and all are great source, right? Uh, these are great session, getting a, gro a global uh, you know, exposure. And uh, so, yeah. Excellent. Thanks, uh, Nikhil. Stay right there. I'll circle back to you in just a minute. Hey, Brendan, when you think of financial services company, they've been slow to move to the cloud. Are you seeing this changing with your customers? And if so, why? Yeah, we have, and, and, and it is actually, I, 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 I always say, because I've been around a while, uh, financial services, in, the financial services companies have typically led every single innovation like right at the front of every aspect of it. And when it comes to cloud, you know, there's been reticence, obviously, a lot of it's got to do with regulation. A lot of it's got to do with the entrenched IT systems we have. We have seen, firstly, the beginnings, you know, as financial services start to go into the cloud, but even within the last 12 months over the pandemic, there is no question it is accelerating. And primarily, you know, what's interesting, Hunter, is we, we think, you know, a lot of it has to do with regulation. A lot of it has to do with compliance. A lot of it has to do with the, just the IT infrastructure that they have in place. I think companies are realizing now that it is, we know it's possible to do it in a way. We've got amazing clients that are doing it. We see a huge expansion of it. 
And uh, one of the reasons why they're doing it is just speed. You, you know, they can do things in the cloud that are fa far faster. Their developers are clamoring for it. It's not just a question of taking a virtual machine and sticking it in the cloud. They want to get access to the new ways of developing software. So we're seeing significant pressure to increase the uh, real estate in cloud across all our financial services customers. And typically, where do you sell into? So it's a, I, I wish it was simpler, but it, you know, the answer is it depends. So uh, in some instances, it depends on the maturity of the company. So we love, it's a, actually, uh, Balaj said it nicely, it's clearly a horizontal problem. We de deal with a horizontal problem. The realization of the problem depends upon the scale of a company's cloud infrastructure and the level of sophistication as it relates to regulation. As it turns out, financial services institutions, some of their cloud real estate isn't as big, but they have a high focus on controls and risk. And so what we find is we basically go both into the security teams and into the cloud teams. Um, it's wonderful if we go into a cloud team and they are really knowledgeable about security, but still in this marketplace there are unquestionable times when the level of cloud knowledge in the security teams is quite frankly, not where it needs to be. And so they don't fully appreciate what's happening. And so we got to go into the cloud team and bring those two teams together. Um, just to finish on that thought, you, you know, in our old world, we're worried about human beings and access to ERP applications. In this world, the things that our customers have to worry about is a serverless function getting access to a database, a Cosmos DB, a Dynamo DB, DB database. They're totally different problems. And some security people aren't fully aware of what's happening under the under the hood of cloud. Got it. Um, let's Brendan certainly set up a follow up one on one call. I'd like to learn more uh, directly. We'd love that. Sarath, you're up next. You there? Yeah, I'm here. Great. Um, you know, when you think of uh, the ideal customer, the, the ideal person in the enterprise that you sell into, what, what area uh, is it? The VP of uh, customer success, call center, or IT? I think uh, AI as a transformation initiative is generally now, most of the companies are led by the CIOs, uh, especially with everybody going remote. Now CIOs are concerned about remote monitoring and so on and so forth. Uh, the other audience that I've generally come across is the chief innovation officer. I think uh, AI is a new thing. Every company wants to adopt to AI. So these are generally uh, people we generally sell to. And I've noticed that it's always been a top-down approach. Uh, when we when you talk about uh, AI technologies, and mostly we sell into large enterprises, uh, uh, ideally about 500 seats and more, um, and and somebody who values a lot of customer experience and and want to kind of get more insights. Those have been the kind of companies and people we sell into. Okay, and then but how can the network help? How can the HMG network help? Uh, ideally, who would you like to meet? Right. So company size, industry profile, individual CIO, I guess. I think uh, from a company profile standpoint, we generally go after companies with north of $100 million in revenue, uh, uh, mostly CIOs um, in a lot of financial services. Uh, I know the audience is financial services today. We sell to, a, sell to a lot of chief compliance officers for them. Uh, what happens on a customer conversations is super critical. They're concerned about compliance. Uh, and then I think the HMG, HMG network is, has access to all the CXOs on this, uh, in this country. So uh, I think any CXO is concerned about uh, customer experience today and every uh, CXO is also wanting to embrace AI and, and we are trying to bring in that human and AI loop into every enterprise so that it's not just showing you a very uh, cool technology, it's about how do you build in the workflows to make that uh, intelligence that you generate more actionable. It's AI to make the call center function more well, smarter, right? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Love it, love it, love it. Uh, Balaj, you're up last. Uh, same question in terms of intros, uh, and how can the network help you? Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, quite a few customers as they are doing these digital transformation to the cloud. One of the biggest things is uh, how the security and not having a lot of visibility and people running around with uh, with the kind of breakneck pace. And any customer that is that is on the digital transformation journey with the security being at the forefront of this as part of the transformation. Uh, typically, uh, we, we, we start, we will have conversations with the CIOs and CISOs you know, because they are the people that are uh, tasked with running and securing that aspect of it. And that we, we would love to have conversations with those kinds of people and uh, 
And generally, our, our target customers are typically G2000 type of customers because that's where you have big enough presence and big enough teams and enough expertise, and they, 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 they want to get ahead of this problem and all that. Excellent. Got it. Uh, final comment, Vlash? Yeah, I mean, we are an incredible, we're at an incredible time where the innovation is going at a pace that, that's been unprecedented. And at the same time, security is trying to catch up to it. So we need to figure out a way to get security to be on par with the kind of thing so that they, they, we won't see any hiccups or roadblocks. Or, or, or security generally has been seen as a, as a, as a laggard. So we needed to figure out a way as, as, as the leaders in the industry, we need to come up with ways to be in, in closely ties with that. Love it, love it, love it. Let's follow. Let's do a follow-up call as well, uh, Laj. I like that. Nikhil, final comment, my friend. Uh, you know, I think so. We, there's always an opportunity in a calamity, and that's what we have to look at it. You know, we have gone through a lot this year, but uh, especially for people in the enterprise IT as well as on the entrepreneur side, I think so. This is a fantastic time to embrace. You've been talking to several people in financial industry, especially where they believe that the uh, digital transformation roadmap has been accelerated by, you know, 10 years, if you will. And uh, as you're embarking on that journey, put a special emphasis on how you're going to secure your application or product security, uh, because that's a fundamental things while other aspects are important, but this is, you know, at the ground level, but uh, super excited time. And thanks for having me. Great, great to see you, Nikhil. Thanks so much. Brendan, final comment, my friend? Final comment, Hunter, is I, I started writing software for terminal servers a thousand years ago. And uh, what I would say is as follows, the current transformation that's happening, digital transformation is the greatest innovation I've seen in my life in terms of its impact across so many different things. It's just incredible to breakneck speed. And as it, you know, as it turns out, as we focus on security, as Balaji and me were focused very much on security and armor code, this digital transformation with cloud will transform security and it'll transform it, not just trying, we're not just trying to secure the cloud or trying to secure digital transformation. We want to do something which will get deliver security far superior to what was possible with an enterprise network and data center. And that is possible. Love it. Great closing comment. And uh, Sarath, final word, word, my friend, any final comments? I think I think all of them have mentioned this is probably the most transformative uh, time in our lives, and I think everybody is embracing technologies. I think I have a lot of security peers here who are making all the cloud migrations feasible with being more secure. Uh, and I think uh, as as an entrepreneur, I think there are so many entrepreneurs here. This is probably the best time to start up, and probably the most scalable way you can build the companies in these times. So, thank you. And Exciting times, guys. I want to thank each of you for being here, sharing your journey, your story, and. Uh, your vision, your passion, passion, your courage and conviction. Uh, we here at HMG really believe in the intersection of innovation, disruption and reimagining the customer journey as well as new business models and new go to markets and want to and need to elevate the industry, the CIO, CTO, CISO and uh, both new entrepreneurs, founders, CEOs, visionaries like yourself into that mix through the context of our summit model uh, the Innovation Accelerator, the standalone Innovation Accelerators, which happen monthly on a global level. So check that out, as well as our research case studies and other roundtables and uh, such. We did one just yesterday with MoveWorks. Uh, if you know Bob and Shaw, great, uh, interesting unicorn to be company coming up. But uh, guys, great summit. A big shout out to our partners. Really appreciate your uh, support for the HMG model here. Uh, partners include today... Darktrace, Zoom, Tessian, Redis Labs, Big ID, Remini Street, uh, and uh, our friends at Horizon 3A, Sonaray, Observe AI, uh, Rubric, and others. Uh, what else? Um, a great summit, a really solid summit. You know, I have my, my book, book six, is, uh, will be offered up to every, all the attendees that, that, uh, that attended here today, if you're interested, to download a digital copy. Uh, next up is August Policio. August is going to talk about uh, uh, the recognition program in 2021 and tonight. Uh, we're recognizing uh, August. Take it away. Hey, Hunter. Thanks for having me. And thanks for everyone who stayed to the end of the program. Um, we're here to recognize our New York Financial Services uh, honoree for the Global Technology Executives in Matter program. 
Uh, today we're recognizing Satish uh, Mudu Krishnan. Satish is the Chief Information Data and Digital Officer at Ally Financial, and we heard from him at the beginning of the program. Here he is on screen. Hi, Satish, how are you? Very good. August, how are you? I'm well. Excellent, excellent job today, really. Thank you. Satish has been a, a welcome addition to the IT leadership team at Ally Financial. He's coming up on his one year anniversary, I think in just a few weeks, right? A few days, six days. Uh I also want to say I'm, I'm joined by my leadership team here. Everybody took time to, to, to join the program today. Awesome. Very happy about that. Um, so what a year it's been to assume an executive leadership position in, in data, information, digital, right? And prior to that, Satish comes from a really long and impressive background in technology, including leadership positions with United Airlines, Honeywell Aerospace, and over 10 years as CIO for American Express, which we talked about a little bit earlier. Across these experiences, Satish has demonstrated excellence in modernizing processes, teams, and technology, resulting in transformative business outcomes. He has a three-pillared IT strategy that's focused on driving customer value, creating a compelling financial trajectory for all of Ally's shareholders and investors, and fostering a world-class culture. Satish, projects that any financial services company uh, need to build an always on digital organization with data capabilities in order to protect itself internally and externally. His team has been excited by creating a centralized data platform underpinned by open source technology, democratizing analytics for his company. But most of all, Satish is a huge advocate for healthy remote work habits this year for his team, uh, still encouraging them to be challenged uh, to continue innovating at an accelerated rate, but focused on preventing burnout. And Satish, I have to go a little off script here and, and tell you that I think we should consider giving you a different type of award for your performance today. More than any other summit I've seen and any other tech leader I've seen, so many of our speakers and panelists throughout the day, throughout the program today, began their statements by saying, as Satish said, or I'm going to refer back to a point Satish made, Satish really hit the nail on the head earlier. He really resonated with the entire community so deeply this afternoon. We really appreciate that. And congratulations on earning your team this award. Thank you. Hey Thank Satish, you. great to see you my friend and a brilliant job. Oh, what a great career, really uh, happy uh, to recognize you here and excited to have uh, you as part of the HMG research um, uh, program that we're designing as well as uh, an interview perhaps for the new book. Thank you. Thank you, Hunter. I, uh, I greatly appreciate the kind words that August said. Um, it's easy to, to stand here and reflect, uh, reflect on the work that the team has done and share what they're doing. And, and all credit goes to the team. I was telling them <clears throat> maybe yesterday, it feels like I'm standing on the shoulders of huge giants and, and the work that they're doing. It's easy that they've lifted, lifted Ally and me up to, to be in this stage. And I accept this award with gratitude and a lot of pride. Gratitude that you guys are recognizing the work that the team is doing, a lot of pride because it, beginning of the year, if somebody had said you would come through COVID successfully propelling the business and yet not drop the ball on everything that you had uh, signed up for, I would have said, you know, I'll go buy a lottery, but that's what the team enabled. So that's why uh, I'm accepting this uh, award with great pride. Awesome. Thank you, Satish. Great job and congratulations to the entire team at Ally. I've been working with a couple of your team members and everyone seems to be really great there. We're really proud of the work that you've done and, and again, really resonated with the audience today. So congratulations. Thank you very much. Excellent. August, that's a wrap. What a great summit, right? Everyone have a great holiday season. Uh, enjoy your families, be safe. And uh, thank you again for being engaging in the HMG financial services model. Look to, uh, Look to our, uh, our Innovation Accelerator standalone hour-long events in 2021. We'll be held monthly with top C CEOs and founders like the Innovation Accelerator was Accelerator just finished up right here. And we're looking for tech leaders to, uh, to join our CXO panel, people that want to see early stage technology companies that we source. They want to find you from around the world, all the way from Silicon Valley, Boston to Atlanta, to Pittsburgh, to Tel Aviv. So, 
reach out to me at Hunter M at HMG Strategy. Find me on LinkedIn uh, or through someone on my team. Take care. And again, uh, be, be courageous leaders. Lean on. Thanks. Bye.